This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Here in Shropshire is a farm frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. Last year, Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn brought it back to life as it would have been in the 1880s. No, no. Under the watchful eye of their landlord, Thomas Acton, they enjoyed many successes. Here it comes. <laughs> Cute and cuddly. And tasted failures. First time in sowing a crop myself, and then come the big day, he's lame. As their time on the farm ended, it was a year that none of them would ever forget. Now they're returning to the farm. Come in. Welcome. To celebrate a Victorian Christmas. Bangs of expectation. Bangs of expectation. On a grand scale. they'll learn new skills. Oh, good grief. <laughs> and be tested to the limit as they return once more to life on the Victorian farm. Don't oh. spoil it. OK. So here's to hard-working Victorian hard farmers. Victorian farmers. Oh. Cheers. Before the Christmas festivities begin, the team must get the farm ready for winter. That means bringing in new livestock. What are you looking for? Just to see if he's got his manly bits about him. Stockpiling food for themselves. If you don't put your back into it, you really notice the difference. And the animals. I think we're going to get a really good crop off of this. But farmers are always at the mercy of the weather. It's been a year since the team left the Victorian farm. They have an appointment with the estate's owner, Mr Acton, and his son Rupert is on his way to take them there. Rupert's picking us up, isn't he? I believe so. What time did he say? Uh, he said, I think it's 3 o'clock. Glad to be back. It's weird, isn't it? It is a bit strange. It is a bit strange coming back. We're looking forward to seeing Mr Acton again, though. Yeah. Catching up yeah. with the uh, affairs of the farm, see yeah. what's happened over the last year. <laughs> What a welcome. Has it been a busy year while we've been gone? It certainly has, yes. I've been doing quite a lot of Rupert's work. got big plans for the team. Really? Right. Right. We'd like you to recreate the Victorian Christmas at Acton Scott. Right. What, for the whole estate? So, yes. Oh, style. my giddy aunt. <laughs> <laughs> when Rupert said, you know, that we're to do Christmas for everybody, there's a bit of me that's a bit... Daunted, I suppose, but but I'm also quite excited about it because I, I do like entertaining. I like I like putting on a big spread. So this this Christmas feast it's you want us to lay on? I mean, what sort of scale are we talking about here? Uh, I would think in the order of uh, uh, 30 to 40 uh, <gasps> individuals. Uh, right. For me personally, Christmas is about coming together. It's going to be about uniting a community. Victorians didn't invent Christmas, but they made it what it is today. They brought us Christmas cards, paper decorations, crackers. And of course, Christmas trees. I'm sure, I see some amazing large scale decorations in a book. But as far as this Victorian Christmas is concerned, well, I remain to be convinced I'm a bit of a Scrooge. I really can't stand the sort of modern commercial Christmas. And in many ways, I blame the Victorians for that. And there's the hall. I'm looking forward to seeing Mr. Acton. Welcome. Can I jump first? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Acton. <laughs> Very good Hello. to see you again. Yes. Are you well? Yes, thank you. Jolly good. Hello, Peter. Hello, Mr. Acton. <laughs> Pleasure to see you again. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good firm handshake. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly good to be back, Mr. Acton. Yes. Well, we're just coming to the busy time of year. Right. I'm very glad to have you. Jolly good. You've got plenty Christmas of may be a few months away, you but preparations have. must start well in advance. I'm sure you'll be more than capable of doing it. Have you had to get through the winter, a Victorian farmer needed a good stock of hay to feed his animals. The survival of his farm depended on it. Well, now, this is the first task. Right. This is a meadow which has grass and clover 
and we want to have it made into hay for next winter's animals to live on. Right. So the hay harvest is going to be our first big job. It is. <laughs> big job is the opposite yes. there. Hay is made from a combination of grasses, which are cut and then dried in the field. A good crop will depend on the weather. And uh, that's the main thing we want to avoid is rainfall. Last year, the hay crop was destroyed by rain. It was the major failure of their 12 months on the farm. Um, I think I'm slightly daunted by the prospect again this year. Naturally. Well, you can't dictate the weather, but uh, when it's right, you must get on with it as quickly as you can. They only have a few weeks if the hay is to be harvested in its prime. The team's base for their year was a labourer's cottage, which they restored from scratch. But since their departure, Rupert has been making changes to it. It's absolutely... Brings the light in, doesn't oh, it? Oh, where's my garden gone? Ah, uh, yes. I'm sorry, uh, I've actually seeded your, your, your garden to grass, but uh, there is some compensation over here. All that work. I've actually oh. made you a new garden in this position, but it needs a bit of work. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I thought perhaps you could plant some vegetables for the Christmas celebrations. Oh, here. right. Yeah. But the real surprise is that Rupert's added a whole new room to the cottage. Gracious. Ooh. Lovely, brand new copper. Yes, well, I know how much you love doing laundry, <laughs> Ruth, so I be built you your very own copper. Coppers were used to heat water for many household tasks. This one can hold about 15 gallons. Oh, it's lovely. Great big, big brick box with a fireplace. Oh, it's so clean. Hasn't there not been a fire it's in here? It's never been used yet. So uh, you'll be the first one to use it. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're just for laundry, but they're really useful cooking vessels, especially when you've got to do great big puddings and things, you know, big boil in the bags and... Actually, Christmas pudding. Yes. Seeing as I've got to do for all those people, that'd be perfect, won't it? Would it? Yes. Go and have a look at Clumper? Yes. Hello, fella. How are you? Long time no see, eh? How are you all right? Clumper was the team's shire horse. Last year, he went lame. Yeah, lovely. It's lovely and smart. Although he's made a full recovery, he's it's it, crucial yeah. he stays fit. Now, the question is, are we going to be able to get him out and do some work with him? See if we can remember how to tack him up? Yes. Go. The Shire horse's tack was perfected in the Victorian period. It evolved from what was used on oxen in earlier centuries. I think he's lost a bit of weight, unlike us. A horse like Clumper can pull around one and a half tonnes. Now, this was always the difficult thing for Clumper. Yeah. Because he never used to like this bit in his mouth. Stand still. Stand there. That's it. There, there we go. go. That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> it's always a wrestle. <laughs> I mean, the trick that myself and Alex were taught, put the thumbs right in the corner of the mouth, there are no teeth, and that makes them bite, move their teeth open. He was a powerful horse, even if he was a bit lame last year. It's good to be back, isn't it? Yeah. The boys want to see how well he's recovered by using him to pull a cart in their old farmyard. Uh, I can see a little pair of ears and a fixed eye. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to see him being used, isn't it? And here's the Thomas Corbett tip cart. Are you all right, with the, are you all right with the first complicated manoeuvre of the uh, afternoon, Peter? Back. Back. Forward. This really is the toughest Back. job, really. Oh. Back, Clumper. Back. Good lad. Good lad. Back. Good Back. lad. Whoa. Good boy. Oh. Steady, steady, steady. That's all right, steady. The tip cart's loaded with manure for use in the new vegetable garden. Steady. Good boy. As they set off, all eyes are on Clumper's hind legs. 
there's no signs of stiffness there, so looks like he's made a full recovery. Good boy. How's he feeling, all right? Yeah, he's looking good though, isn't he? Yeah. We might be able to use him for our hay harvest. Wow, look at that. Our cottage. Doesn't it look smart? <laughs> good lad, Whoa. that's brilliant. That's good perfect. Boy. Spot on. Stand. Well, that saved us a lot of shoveling. Yeah, shame we can't tip it into the cart. This should keep Ruth happy. I thought the first thing I'd do with my lovely new copper is um, make some soap to do the cleaning. Making your own soap at home is something that people have been doing for generations. Um, and there are, in the Victorian period, still any number of soap recipes in ordinary household manuals. All soap, wherever you buy it from or wherever you make it, is just a fat and an alkali mixed together, in essence. The alkali releases the acids in fat, reacts with them and forms soap. It could be any sort of fat. So I'm just using some rather old beef fat that I managed to catch off the butchers. So I'm starting off by popping it in the copper and letting it all boil down into a liquid, basically. That's going to take quite a while. The alkali Ruth's using is caustic soda. So I'm going to add my caustic soda into the water. You have to be really careful when you do this because an exothermic reaction will occur, which means it'll sort of boil all by itself, chemically. It's great. Something quite violent is beginning to happen in there. Oh, gosh, it is. Well, there's a nice selection of bits and pieces over here, isn't there? Now they've seen Clumper in action, the boys must inspect the haymaking equipment. Sort of going like this. Yeah, good for rowing up. They've dug out their trusty farming Bible. Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm, for advice on what to use. Throughout the 19th century, thousands of workers flocked from the countryside to the cities. Get in there quick. As part of this upheaval, much farm work became mechanised. Like, yeah, this one here in the Book of the Farm, and this kicks it up, yeah, tedding of hay. Alex and Peter will be relying on this labour-saving machinery. And there's one piece of kit they'll need more than any other. This is the uh, the daddy though. This is the thing that we're is really going to save us some labour, isn't it? What the Bamford hay loader? What a wonderful piece of kit. The hay loader scoops up the hay and lifts it onto a horse-drawn wagon or dray. Traditionally, you have a whole army of villagers pitching the hay up onto the dray with pitchforks. But in the late 19th century, you've got a shortage of labour. So these kind of devices really are a bit of a godsend. Right, so we'll get this out, shall we? Yes, let's give it a Have try. It. Should we go together? Yep. OK, I'm clear right. at the moment. Just let me... Right, uh, top, 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 top. I mean, that's heavy. <laughs> that's got to be heavy. <laughs> Here it comes. OK, have I got clearance up there yet? Nice, Peter, nice. The Bamford's hay loader yeah. weighs nearly a quarter of a ton. OK. I'm going to need you up here to drop this down for you. It really yeah. hangs, that goes down. OK. Just ever so... Oh. 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 Welcome back to the Victorian farm. Yeah. <laughs> it smells soapy. It certainly no longer smells of fat. I'm just going to pop a little handful of common salt in. Don't need a lot. Get a good stir. Oh, yes, look, something's happening immediately. There it is. There's a solid forming. That solid is soap. This is my hard soap, quite caustic and tough, so it's good for doing really filthy, dirty jobs where you need something super powerful. This is going to be 
super hard soap. I can tell by the very white graininess as I push it into the mould. It'll set rock solid. The soap takes around four hours to set. So I'm just giving this chamber pot a really good go with a more caustic soap. And it's brilliant for this sort of job. Yeah. Alex and Peter are struggling to get the hayloader working. And then it goes underneath the big complicated piece of kit, this. That chain is tight, but it's on. Is that going to be too tight to give it a try now, do you think? Uh, who knows? Should we give it a go? Yeah, yeah let's give it a go. Come on. Right. Right. Let's go. Yep. And there we go. Well, that's probably... Excellent. So we're the dray. This is attached to the dray, being pulled by the horse. The dray is the cart that we're loading the hay onto. Yeah. And this machine's driving these spikes, which will be lifting the hay up this elevator, tipping it right to the top. Whoa! Over the top. Onto the dray. Onto the dray. And hopefully, that's going to save us an inordinate amount of work in the field. It's ready to go. Right, do you want to put this back in then and I'll go and check the other bits of kit? <laughs> While it's, things are still quiet, I thought I might get on with a couple of preparations. I'm going to get started on the mincemeat for Christmas. It's one of those things that the further in advance you make it, the better it tastes. Ruth is using a recipe from the 1850s containing lemons, apples, raisins, currants and candied peel. If you go back to the medieval periods and you look for mince or shred pies, you'll find that they're mostly meat. Um, and then, then they're just sweetened and flavoured with a little bit of raisin and a little bit of spice, which were fearfully expensive ingredients at the time. And of course, over time, as these expensive imported ingredients begin to drop in price, people put more and more in. And gradually the meat content goes down and the sweet content starts to rise. And in the 19th century, for many people, that meat element just falls away completely. The only thing, however, that sort of harks back and tells you where it came from is the suet. Um, and modern mincemeat does mostly still contain suet. And suet, of course, is fat from a cow. In particular, this is a piece of what gets, sometimes gets called a codlie, which means um, the fat which hangs near a cow's cods. Cods is an old word for genitalia. And finally, last ingredient, brandy. The mincemeat will be stored in jars to absorb the liquid becoming sweet and juicy over the coming weeks. It should be really delicious and make the most wonderful mince pies for Christmas. A week into their return, it's time for a catch-up. You look like a man who needs a top-up there, Peter. Thank you very much. Go on, then, get that down your neck. So mm. what state is all the hay in? It doesn't look too bad. As the grass is coming through and give it a couple of weeks, it'll, uh, I'm sure, be ready to cut. But it's largely going to be a case of keeping the eye on the weather. Yes. What a familiar story. <laughs> Every time we talk about making hay, there's some sort of dark cloud comes, comes over, in, as if to say, yes. don't even try it. Yes. So, Ruth, what do you think of the cottage, then? It's so posh, isn't it, in comparison to what it was when we were here last? It's good to be back. It's good to see you again. Cheers. Oh, cheers. Mm. That's good old Acton cider. You can feel it going down. With a few weeks to go before the hay's ready to cut, there are plenty of other jobs to do. The estate's flock of Shropshire sheep needs a new ram, and the run-up to winter is the perfect moment to choose one. The ram can then be introduced to his ewes in time to produce lambs for spring. Where better to find a top-class animal than at the Royal Agricultural Society of England's annual show? The show was started by the Victorians in 1839. Today it's held at Stoneleigh Park in Warwickshire. 
Dr. John Wilson is the society's librarian. Did you know on the farm yourself, the whole thing about the society and about the shows was this achievement of excellence. The finest livestock, but also the best type of farming. It was very competitive. It was a great distinction to have a prize, not only to the owner of an estate or the owner of a farm, but for the stockmen, the workers, and so on. Don't forget, Britain at that time was the stock farm of the world. The Victorians were masters of animal breeding, and their skills were among the most celebrated and highly prized in agriculture. Selecting the right ram could determine the quality of a farmer's flock and his profits for years. Peter's called in an old friend, Richard Spencer, to help. Richard has five decades' experience of sheep farming. I've been tasked to come purchase ram for our flock. Ah. So I've called on you for a bit of advice, if I may. Responsibility big. Big, yes. OK, well, you've come to the right place. There are quite a few different breeds here, and you've got some really good examples of the different breeds. And uh, when we've had a look, you can make your own decision, then we'll take it from there. OK, thanks. You make the decision, you're spending the money. Richard's lined up four Victorian breeds for Peter to choose from. We've got two Hampshires, two Shropshires, two Wensleydales, and two Oxfords. The Oxfords are the first in line. So what exactly am I feeling for here? Well, what do you want in these sheep for? You want these sheep for the meat. You put your hand there, the jigger. That's your Sunday roast, new potatoes, garden peas. Imagine carving a slice of meat off that. Oh, I couldn't much have better. Mint sauce, beautiful. These are totally different. These are a long wool breed. These are Wensleydales. These will milk their socks off. With more milk, do you get a better quality of lamb? You may well get a faster growing lamb because right. using them on the Shropshires. Yes. That'll be the sit. The Shropshires will provide the base, and these just put a little bit something different in there. Would you be looking for anything on the face of the sheep? Well, if ever you're looking to buy a ram, you want something that's masculine. You don't want a ram with a weak little pathetic effeminate face. That's right in the right place. But a ram, it's not. A ram has got to be macho, in control, ready to go, to take mm. on the flock of ewes. And you want a ram with an aggressive face. All these rams have got it. Next, they move on to the Shropshires, the only breed of ram Peter has any experience with. What's a ram there for? Well, it's, it's there to uh, progress my flock. Exactly, to breed. What does he breed with? His wedding tackle. Of course. And there must be two of them underneath, hanging level. Beautiful. I mean, you've got to make this decision. I don't envy you. So basically, I've got to picture the offspring from this mm. and Absolutely. my Absolutely. was a very, very difficult choice to make. That is what breeding is all about. Back at the farm, with the hayfield growing fast, Alex is busy preparing for the harvest. Hello, Ian. He's come to see Acton Scott's oh, resident woodworker, here, yeah. Ian Wall. Um, Ian, we've got a, a hay harvest imminent, and one of the tools we're in desperate need of is a hay rake. Apparently, you're the man to show me how to make one. I can do that. The hay rake is an essential tool for gathering the crop in the field. It's made from an ash log. And the idea is you're going to split that with an axe and a mallet. With a mallet, OK. So you place the axe in the centre and smack it with this. So right, OK, go. OK. It's done there. And how, how many blows do you think this is going to take? To uh, well, I think you'll probably do it in about ten. Two. One, no, it's two, three. three. It's a bit like a fairground game, isn't it? It is. Five, six, seven, eight. Go on, go for it. Nine, one more. Oh! Ten. Right, OK. You failed there, Alex. I failed? Well, it's not split. Hang oh, it's on still a splitting. I can hear it. Oops. Ah. I've got the axe stuck. Keep going, keep going. Um, move. There we are. I'll hold the axe. I hate to see that blunted on your leg. Get in there. There we are. You're now looking at something that no one in the world has seen before. What? the inside of this tree. Right. <laughs> Fantastic. And this, this is the original sapling that was growing. The very, right. the very heartwood. Right. The wood is shaved into a rectangular shape in order to make the head of the rake. Uh, this is the vice where we're going to drill the holes. Right, OK, so we've got and our it, rake head here. It will sit in there. Just tip it forward, 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 yep. forward, forward, a bit more, a bit more. No, more. stop! OK. Right. 
So the trick is here, keeping them all in a good alignment, because you don't want your rake ending up buck-toothed. And out of that... Next one, come the teeth. Five. We're going to knock this bit of wood yep. onto this uh, metal bar, which is hollow. Yeah. And as we knock it, it'll come through and yep. out the other side. OK, so there you go. Your first tine. Right, OK. Woodworkers like Ian were common in much of the Victorian countryside. But despite being highly skilled, they were called bodgers, and the work they did was known as bodging. Ian has a theory about this. A bodger, he worked with green wood. He would make the legs and the spindles for chairs. Mm. And because it was green, they then needed to dry out. And one theory is, when you made the holes in the seat, round hole, you'd go to put the leg in, and the leg had dried out, and as it dries, it shrinks, and it doesn't quite fit. So you could say that was a bodge job. But it wasn't the bodger's fault, it's Mother Nature's fault. That's it. Finally, the teeth have to be yeah. banged into the rake head. Okay. That's it, you're through. Here we go. The moment of truth awaits. OK, so here we are. Look down the line. Ooh. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I can see one out of a mirror. Well, one or two are drunk. No, that's, that's not as bad as I thought, actually. Could be better. Well, that's smashing, Ian. That really is. That's a, that's a work of art, a finished product. Well, you should be proud of that. Right, Pete, you've seen them, you've looked at them, you've looked at all the attributes. It's now up to you to make the decision. Go for it. It's a tough decision. It's a very tough decision. I am quite drawn to the first Oxford we looked at, purely because of the shape of the rump. I can understand that. However, I think Mr Acton did say it can be any ram as long as it's a Shropshire. As long as it's a Shropshire? Yeah, right, I think so he wants to keep the breed pure. OK, so you've now got to go for one of two. This one is slightly broader in the back, I'd say. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. Probably for that reason I'd be inclined to go for this one. It's not only livestock the team must bring in before the cold weather. Bread was a staple of the farmer's diet, so flour was crucial for winter stores. Ruth and Alex are going to make wheat into flour the traditional Victorian way. Oh, now that's wow. a sight. Look at that. <laughs> I bet you're glad to see it carrying that lot. Yes, I am. In the mid-19th century, England had around 10,000 working windmills. Only 50 or so are operating today. Wilton Windmill in Wiltshire was built in 1821. The first job is to get its sails turning. Each one is 32 feet high. Volunteer Steve Chidke has been trained to climb them. It must be pretty nerve-wracking up there, is it, Steve? <laughs> yes, it is, when you get to the top. How did you feel the first time you did this? Uh, terrified. I couldn't stop my feet from shaking. Mills were usually worked by just one miller, helped by his wife or an apprentice. Just pull it snug and she's ready to go. Mike Clark has been a miller for 15 years. Up she goes. We're going up to the <laughs> fourth floor, so we wait for three lots of bangs. Right. One. Creak, creak. It's not a rush job. Second one. When we hear the third one, I just let go. And the sack will come down and sit on the closed trap doors. That's cunning, isn't it? Four flights up, the wheat grain is funneled down again for the grinding to begin. Break off, please. Off! So that was... What was that, then? That's oh, what... that's taking the break off. <laughs> Excellent. Do we go inside now? I would think so, yeah. We can start the milling. Come on, Rammy. 
the new Shropshire ram has arrived on the farm. What do you think of Acton Scott then? We've got the fields down here. This is the hall. It's going to be your new home. Mm, I know. Don't let me down. Hi, Merle. How are you? Hi, Hi Peter. I've got a ram here. I open the gate. Merle Wilson is in charge of the home farm's livestock. It's up to her to decide whether Peter's made the right choice. What are you looking for? Just to see if he's got his manly bits about him. Oh, fair enough. There's no good having a ram that can't do the job. True. But this one's got both of them, so that's fine. I'm just going to look at his mouth to see that he's got his teeth. We're just looking to see that they lie nicely against the top. The top gum there. Gum. Sheep only have front teeth in the bottom of their mouths. This may make it easier for them to grab the grass with their tongues. All species of ruminant, including cattle, antelope and giraffe, lack these top front teeth. Yeah, it's these two big teeth here. I yeah, never, never look a gift horse in the mouth, but if you're paying through the nose for your sheep, I definitely you... check its teeth. That's right. Well, what do you think of him, anyway? He's quiet, so that's very important, because some rams can be very nasty. Mm. Mr Acton will be very pleased. Well, it's all yours. Tuppy. Good boy. So what's happening here? These are the millstones. So the bin up there that we tip the wheat in comes down this chute, feeds this hopper. And this hopper is open at the bottom to this shoe. And this shoe shakes the wheat. And this little metal four-pronged thing, you see, it's called a damsel, and that damsel meters the wheat into the eye of the stone. Why is it called a damsel, then? That's a good question. <laughs> 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 it's because it chatters away all day. Chatters away all day, like a damsel. Yeah, but we're not allowed to say that. We're not allowed to say that. <laughs> Each of the millstones weighs three quarters of a ton. They can move at 120 revs a minute, two turns a second but it's all dependent on the strength of the wind. Look how quickly yes. that's dropped away again. That little gust of wind and yeah. just straight back down. We might yeah. grind to a halt. Right. So that, that's the origin of the, the expression. That is so indeed. when something grinds to a halt, it's simply because there's not enough wind and everything stopped. That's right. So can we go and see where the flower comes out? Next fall down. Well, it seems like it's totally ground to a halt now, doesn't it? I'm afraid it has. It's it such is. a funny day. It is. Well, let's have a look at this flower, then. Mm. Let's feel a bit. In product. What do you think, Ruth? We've got a quite coarse grind, haven't we? Right. Can you alter the size of the grind so you get finer or oh, coarser? Oh, indeed. Our grindstones are just up here. Right. And this screw here controls, controls the gap between the stones. Oh, right. I see. Uh, when she's turning, you, you catch what's coming down the spout, put it between your finger and thumb, and by rule of thumb... Rule of thumb, right. If it's a little coarse, uh, just, just a, a, twitch a twitch on this makes all the difference. It's a really sort of organic thing, this, isn't it? You can, you you know, everything by touch and by smell and by feel. It's all the senses used to run the mill. Being at the mercy of the elements, the Victorian farmer needed skilled judgment to know when best to sow and harvest his crops. With the hay meadow in its prime, Peter's decided to seek some advice. Swallows are fairly low. Yes. Mr Acton has lived on the estate all his life and knows its climate intimately. The Victorian farmer wouldn't have had access to a daily weather forecast, so how are we going to tell what the weather's going to be like when we come to make hay? Well, he has to do the best he can with predicting from the signs that he sees. Right. Such and as? Such as these uh, swallows, which are feeding on insects, and uh, they're flying very low. That means that the air is moist. Right. If it was uh, drier, the insects would go up, and so would the swallows. Then we can look at the clouds, and we can deduce a certain amount from that. One over there, which is becoming a cumulonimbus, 
which yep. is not good. I know that can drop heavy amounts of rain. For over 50 years, the Acton family has kept a record of rainfall on the estate. It's a crucial tool for the farmer to work out how much moisture has fallen on his crop. Now, yesterday there was quite a storm, so we decide how much it was in terms of inches by putting it into that measuring glass. And we read it, 0.29. Now, an inch of rain is 100 tonnes to every acre. So working down from that, how would you calculate it? Around about the 25 tonnes per acre mark. Yes. If it's uh, 0.29 inches. That's a lot of rain. Yes. You don't want that falling on your hay if you can possibly avoid it. While the hay meadow dries, preparations for Christmas continue. Christmas was given a complete makeover by the Victorians. To find out more, Peter's come to meet toy maker Jeff Nunnery. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Peter. Good to see you. Pleasure to meet you. I love these wooden toys. Yeah. Really takes me back to my childhood. I sort of grew up in Germany. Right. And even today, it's a wash of wooden toys. Wooden toys. The Victorian age saw the birth of the toy industry, and since then, toys and Christmas have become inextricably linked. So who would be the customers in the Victorian period for you, these kind of toys? Well, I think there'd probably be two groups. There, there's obviously the people with the most money would get these toys, which are panel doors, the doll's houses. Yeah. These obviously take a lot of work, a lot of time. These are the windows for the doll's house. So they were very expensive. Yeah. Anyone with um, less income had the hoop and ball sort of toy, which was fairly simply made. Less work, less time, less expensive. Even the cheapest toys, though, were out of reach of the working classes. It was in the Victorian period that the idea of giving gifts really took off, as did many of the Christmas traditions. And uh, one of these is Father Christmas. But even in the Victorian period, his identity hadn't yet been sealed. You could still see him in a number of guises, a number of different robes. But the image we all know and love today didn't come about until the 1930s when Coca-Cola had a gentleman dressed in a large red suit, white beard, very, very jolly, advertising their product. I'm hoping to pick up something that the kids at Acton Scott are going to enjoy. Uh-huh. So I'll probably take a couple away if I may. Yeah, no problem. For the Victorian farmer, work didn't stop for Christmas and it was crucial to have a good store of animal feed for the winter. They weren't back. The weather's set fair for the next few days, so it's time to make hay while the sun shines. Well, Expert local horseman Brian Davis has come to help out. Brian has brought along his highly trained pair of shires. Take it away. Oh. And we're off. Here we go. The boy's job is to gather the cut grass into rows. This is perfect. This is good. It's, it's actually quite thick. It's... I think we're going to get a really good crop off of this. And you won't believe it, but the sun's come out as well. <laughs> How's your hay rake doing? Well, it's doing very well, actually, and I'll tell you why it's doing well. Yeah. Because Mr Acton gave me a really hot tip on how to use it. Normally, you're out in the garden, you're raking your leaves like this, yeah? Yeah. OK. But that's bad for the tines. You'll snap the tines. Right. You're supposed to use it like this. OK. I'm really getting under it. Just pulling it up how? and out. Yeah, very nice. Getting there. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Less chit-chat, more work. <laughs> This is only the first stage of haymaking. Once cut, the grass needs to dry out in the field. But as the day goes on, 
the colour of the sky doesn't bode well. What do you think of that, Peter? I don't think it looks good. See, that? that's cumulus nimbus right at the back. If it rains, we just deal with it. That's all we can do. We've cut it now. It's a lot further than we got last year. It's heavy. Oh, I know. <laughs> In the dairy, Ruth and her daughter Eve are preparing for the hay harvest celebrations. We're making butter. So first of all, the cream goes in. This is a great thing, this Victorian churn. It's just a barrel, really, on a hinge, so that it spins round. And then... OK, you're the youthful muscle of this operation, so go for it. Be strong. <laughs> so what's happening inside the churn is, like, all the cream's being sort of agitated and bashed around and it's making all the little globules of fat bump into each other and when they bump to each other they stick together They're joining up getting bigger and bigger and bigger it's like planet formation or something um, and eventually we'll find that we've all the fats in one lump and we'll have a complete separation a solid fat and a liquidy buttermilk so what we're listening out for is that the moment that the butter comes and that's the technical term You'll hear this sort of wet splash because it's now separated into a solid and a liquid. Mind change. Oh, that feels different. Those it? sounds, I think. Can you hear? Yeah. They're splashing. Yay! 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 Butter come! Okay. Whew. So that's go. our butter and our buttermilk. The next stage is to remove the buttermilk. It's squeezed out using a 19th century invention called a butter worker. Oh, can you hear that buttermilk coming out? Yeah, definitely. This ensures the butter isn't touched by the dairymaid's hands, which could melt it. In fact, the most prized quality a dairymaid could have was cold hands. But that wasn't all they were known for. Dairymaids were considered to be um, well, a bit sexually alluring, actually. Dairy maids have to be very, very clean. You have to keep the spaces around you scrupulously clean. You have to keep your clothes scrupulously clean. And gentlemen used to have fantasies about them. And you see that in all the literature as well. If you think, read of things like Tess of the D'Urbervilles, you know? Tess works as a dairy maid. She's clean, pure, sweet, beautiful, and, of course, has her reputation destroyed. So you watch your step, young lady. <laughs> Cheers, you see anybody posh? Run a mile. Run a mile. Okay. Cover yourself in dirt. <laughs> Don't let them know you do dairying. <laughs> Why do mothers have to be so embarrassing? <laughs> That'd be great for the hay harvest. I think the boys like them. Steady does it. Steady. The rain is holding off, so Alex and Peter are getting on with the next stage of haymaking drying the cut grass to turn it into hay. This process is called tedding. The boys are keen to try it because it's featured in Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm. Good boy. It's looking good, isn't it? Let's see what this beauty can do. Yeah. Now, the thing is, is it's quite controversial, this, because a lot of the people around here have said the old way of making hay is to simply cut the grass and let the sun do the work for the first two or three days. So it dries the top of the grass and it makes it that much lighter to work with. But of course, Stevens here is recommending a new and innovative way of making hay. And the idea is that with its spikes there, its tines, it goes round the field, just picking the freshly mown grass up into the air and starts drying it out. We just need to set these spikes so they're gonna to touch the ground. There we go, that's, that's now pretty dangerous. You, you excited? I'm slightly nervous, to be honest, but... Um, well, this is it, Alex, we're making hay. Let's make hay. Like Alex and Peter, Clumper's never used this equipment before. Oh, steady, Clumper. Steady, boy. Steady. Good lad. Steady, steady, steady. Steady, whoa, 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 
Whoa, just stand there. Something is clearly bothering him. Is that particularly... It's coming over the top and hitting yeah, him. Yeah, it's coming over the top and hitting him on the... On his backside. Yeah. That might be the problem. It might very well be the problem. Shall I, shall I change the gears round? Yeah. Right, that's now, that's now going to kick it over the top. Ah, that's more like it. With the grass no longer falling on him, Clumper's much happier. Now that is just great to see. If he can keep his cool and I can keep my cool, we will be making hay. It's already drying out quite a bit. I mean, there's still a hell of a lot to do, but, you know, we really are getting there. Steady, boys, that's it. After a week, the hay is turning golden in the field. Yep. Now it needs raking, so that it can be lifted easily onto the wagon. This is a side delivery rake, which effectively combs all the hay into long rows. It's a fantastic piece of kit. So dare I say, it seems as if we have a hay crop. Success at last, within our grass. But before they can bring the hay in, the weather takes a turn for the worse. For several days, the crop is battered by rain. Once you've cut the hay, you're committed to making hay. And you can control pretty much every single element about it, except for the weather, and it's raining. It, it's raining hard. And it, I mean, if, if this keeps up, I mean, it, it'll be a failure. And it, it'll be deja vu, basically. We've come this far, but with this rain, it, it can now just all be lost at the last minute. It'll just rot on the field. This is awful. This is truly awful. With no hope of working outside, Ruth gets on with an indoor job, turning the freshly ground flour into bread. Traditional brick ovens like this one go back for centuries and centuries and right into the Victorian period with a best for baking bread. What I'm trying to do is make a fire inside that will heat the bricks. It's not the fire, it's the hot bricks that cook the bread. Victorian farms generally had good supplies of fuel, but most non-farmers could ill afford the firewood or coal, so bought their bread from a baker. When we went to the windmill, um, they've ground it in the flour nicely for us because all the bran is still in them. And although it's very good fibre through your system, if you have a lot of it in the bread, you get a really very heavy bread um, that's really quite chewy. Um, and Victorians were looking for a much lighter loaf where they could possibly get it. So I want to take some of the bran out. This process is called bolting. It removes some, but not all, of the bran leaving behind a creamy-coloured flour. But in the 19th century, new technology meant that all of the bran was taken out at the start of the milling process. What you get out the other end is pure ground starch. This began to cause problems with so many people living on bread, 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 bread and potatoes bread. If you've got a bread that is less nutritious, even though it's bulky, you have people having problems with their diet. In fact, it became so much of a problem that eventually they had to introduce legislation to put nutrients back into flour for bread making. Next, yeast, water and salt are added. It's starting to come together now into a mass. 
Now comes the really fun bit. I get to knead it. Now the longer and more vigorously I knead this, the more chance we have of having a light, fluffy bread. Like every other job, this is hard work. <laughs> and it's one of those jobs that if you don't put your back into it, you really notice the difference with the finished product. After four hours, the good. dough has risen. So I've got to knock it back and then start shaping my dough. So the traditional shape for bread made at home in your own bread oven is the cottage loaf. So that's what I shall do. Now I'm going to rake out the oven. This bit's always a bit frantic. The fire's died down. It's nice and hot. I've got to get all this ash out quickly and the bread in before it starts to cool too much. Always a dangerous moment because you're raking burning ashes out on top of your feet. Here we go. Bread to go in. Traditionally, ovens like these would hold 12 loaves, with perhaps a 13th to make a baker's dozen. Leave that for 45 minutes to cook. At last, the sun is out. The hay has survived the downpours. Alex has lent Ruth his handmade rake, and it's time to bring out the loader. It looks good. Okay, yep, come on. Ooh. Jesus, we're supposed to work whilst it's doing this. Here it comes! <laughs> okay. Whoa! Ah, that's it. <laughs> this is going to be extremely hard work. Coming through my legs there. Oh. <laughs> that's novel. Hey! Oh. Oh. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to build like a, it's almost like a wall of hay along one side and a wall along the other. And all the time just trampling it down and packing it down so we can get as much on here as possible. Spoon bits for me to rake up. Yeah, that's the idea, Ruth. Well, you've yeah. got to have a job, Ruth, otherwise you'd be in the workhouse, wouldn't you? <laughs> Was that your leg? Very, very <laughs> close. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. Who had money on the hay rake breaking? <laughs> Not me. You just have to get on your hands and knees now, Ruth. Oh, oh God. Here you go. Come on. It's like canoeing. Good going, Peter. Whoa. This machine is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I've only stabbed Alex once with a pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the fact that they helped save labour, hay loaders weren't popular in Victorian Britain. And Peter and Alex are discovering a possible explanation. So this is in fact one of the reasons why this thing didn't take off. <laughs> because, because you can't do this whilst you're standing, whilst it's moving. Is that the dray there? Yeah. Okay. It's all right, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> oh, Peter! Oh. <laughs> that is haymaking done. <laughs> the final job is to store the crop in the hayloft, ready to feed the animals throughout the coming winter. Their first major task in the run-up to Christmas is complete. It's an absolute joy to find myself almost immersed in hay because I really didn't think I'd see the day. Tell you what, Alex. Yeah? I need a beer. <laughs> <laughs> After yeah. all the work and worry, a triumphant hay harvest calls for a party. Now to 
hands as the sun was shining bright in the high days of the year. Twas down in yonder... Folk musician John Kirkpatrick has come to celebrate with the team. See how the little fishes, how they do sport and play, causing many a lad and many a lass together a making hay. He's chosen one of the few haymaking songs with a wholesome theme. Most are much racier in tone. Corn harvest and hay harvest were the biggest times of the year where everyone would muck together and so you'd spend all day with people of the opposite sex and so a lot of these songs deal with sort of running off around the back of the haycocks and having a bit of a frolic in the hay and you know, guaranteed a different harvest of a different kind <laughs> in a few months. <laughs> uh, may, may, maybe this is why they're introducing machines to get rid of yes. the labour force. <laughs> That's why they had to invent machinery. <laughs> Here we go. It's time for the homemade bread and butter. Oh, you've got some there. OK. Oh, that butter's nice. And that bread. No, it's got something to it. It's absolutely mm. delicious, isn't it? But does the hay meet Mr Acton's exacting standards? Hello, Mr Acton. Hello, Mr Acton. Oh. Hello, Alex. Hello, Peter. Is this a sample? This is a sample, yes. View inspection. Yes, not bad at all. Can you tell a lot from the smell of the hay, then? Oh, yes, you can, yes. Yes, um, it needs to smell sweet. If it smells musty, that means... Uh, um, spores of mould, and uh, that's not good for the animals. Right. Yes, each time I smell it, it smells better. Well, well that's a good sign. <laughs> I think the animals will uh, relish it during the winter. Mm. OK, folks, we're going to do Sir Roger de Coverley, a lovely old English country dance. It's been done for hundreds of years. And fascinatingly, in Scotland, this dance is called the Haymaker's Jig, so it's very appropriate. And it's mentioned in A Christmas Carol as well as one of the classic country dances for Christmas time, so it'll get you in the mood for Christmas. And right hand turn. And the other. Left. Keep swinging, keep swinging. We now have a hayloft brimming with freshly mown hay, so... All done let's, and dusted. Let's One hope. weight off our minds. Two hands. Yeah, well, that hay's going to last the cattle over winter. Yep. Yeah, Congratulations. Absolutely. Congratulations. Back to back. Roll on Christmas, eh? Yeah. Cheers. Bar humbug. Down the Here in Shropshire is a farm frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn have returned to the Acton Scott estate to celebrate a Victorian Christmas on a grand scale. Here we go. And we'd like you to recreate the Victorian Christmas at Acton Scott. Right. What, for the whole estate? Yes. Last oh, start. my giddy aunt. <laughs> so far, they've brought in the hay crop to feed the livestock through the winter and begun the festive preparations. It should make wonderful mince pies for Christmas. Now, as Christmas approaches, thoughts turn to presents, treats and staving off the cold. But work on the farm never stops. They need to make 10,000 bricks by hand. And it's tough. It is so tough. And the blacksmith's forge must be restored and ready for business in time for Christmas. So here's to hard-working Victorian, hard -working farmers. Victorian farmers. Cheers. Peter and Alex are about to get their first taste of the donkey work involved in preparing for a Victorian Christmas. Now, we use the Shire horses for most of the big jobs on the farm, and they really are the sort of equivalent, if you like, of a modern-day tractor. When you've got two of them and you're out in the fields ploughing, that's your tractor, just one on its own. It's more like a sort of four-wheel drive, a Land Rover-type thing. 
okay? Mm -hmm. But every farmer needs a nice little run around on the farm, a kind of quad bike. And what we have is Dusty the donkey. No Victorian farm would be without its donkey. The thing we've got to get to grips with is just how to tack him up. Right, okay. Just like a normal horse? Just <laughs> ever so small. Everything's in miniature. You know, I've never seen an animal that looks quite so miserable all of the time. Dusty. It's the saddle. It's the cart saddle. There we are, it's on there. Yeah. yeah that's, it, that's tight enough. So, we've got everything we need. Let's go then. Try and get him in the cart and see how yeah. he fares. The boys are in search of the centrepiece for their Victorian Christmas celebration. The Yule Log. I think it's over just past that oak. Lovely big oak tree though, isn't it, that? Well, there's something over there that's fallen down, windfall. What about that beauty over there? Look at that. I know, that looks nice, doesn't it? That is a tasty bit of wood. Traditionally, the Yule log would have been large enough to burn for several days throughout Christmas. You won't be able to get up and put some more logs on the fire? No. Hopefully, I'll be drinking all 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> but we need a bit of wood that's going to burn in the hearth. OK, you I'm, pull. I'm pulling. I'm pulling. Oh. To cut the log, they're using a genuine Victorian cross-cut saw, borrowed from Mr Acton. This will be burning for 12 years, let alone 12 days. You're a man that hates Christmas. Yeah. I'm hating it even more, Peter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, it's actually, it is normally me that breaks everything. So it's nice to see someone else on the Victorian farm breaking something. Oh, dear. It's typical. Absolutely typical. At the cottage, Ruth's growing food for the winter. I'm starting off our mushroom bed. It's such a Victorian thing to do. Almost all the books you read have instructions on how to grow mushrooms. And it does make a really good crop that you can be harvesting right through the winter. So the first thing you have to do is to make a really deep bed of well-rotted horse manure. Trample it down. By having a big, deep, fat layer, it'll sort of warm from underneath and hopefully there's your fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit. I've got spores to go in here, sort of the fungi equivalent of seeds. So I'm just going to sprinkle my spores on. La, 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 la. And then likely fork it. Mushrooms like to grow somewhere damp and dark. <laughs> so leaving the heap just exposed to the air, the top would dry out and they wouldn't like that at all. So this is to keep the damp in and to keep the worst of the sunlight off it. It'd be rather nice for Christmas dinner to be able to offer mushrooms homegrown alongside everything else. The saw breaking turns out to be a blessing in disguise. You bungled, didn't you? Well, no, actually, you did us the, uh, the, the good favour of breaking the saw just before we cut through this log here, which, in fact, has a conservation order on it. <laughs> and it would have meant that this Yule log would have cost us an absolute fortune. <laughs> Thousands of pounds. Now, the reason these things have conservation orders on them is because they're allowed, they're left here, to rot in the field and all of the insects that then take to the tree and you can see all the little worm holes here then encourage all sorts of different wildlife. In particular, woodpeckers will be bouncing up and down this log, seeking out lovely little tasty grubs. So it's really, really good for the environment to have logs like this lying around and not burning in the hearth at the hall as a yule log. However, thankfully, we have got a piece of ash that fell down in this field that's been down for about three years. It's well seasoned. We've chopped off the end yep. and it's going to make a lovely yule log. Ooh. You're in, Don. Oh, perfect fit. Dan, Dan there, Dusty. To the hall.
good lad. Get this bark stripped off it. Yeah. A few more months seasoning and this will be absolutely perfect, won't it? Yeah. This should burn really well. We'll put a bit of oil on these wheels, don't we? <laughs> With Christmas approaching, Ruth's come to the nearby Blist Hill Victorian village in Shropshire to buy some material for making presents. Ah, oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Um, well, I was uh, thinking of some flannel, actually. Mm -hmm. I've got some very good Welsh flannel. Would that Ooh. be yes. interesting? Welsh flannel is a really nice warm fabric. Not fancy, but really quite hard wearing and very insulative, really good against the cold. Such woolen fabrics were believed to help wick all the sweat and uh, things away from the body to leave you with a really healthy skin. Right. What is Madame making? Um, I want to make two pairs of gentlemen's drawers and two gentlemen's vests. It's for a Christmas present. Very much. Thank you. Back at Acton Scott, Alex and Peter have an appointment with their land agent, Rupert Acton, in a neglected corner of the estate. So this is a project which I'd uh, like you to both can have a look at. Right. To see if you can uh, perhaps get it working again. Well, let's give it our best shot. It's all a bit overgrown here, isn't it? It certainly is. This tumble down cottage was once a blacksmith's forge the industrial heart of Acton Scott. How yeah. long has it been derelict? This has been unused for about 40 years. It would have been in its heyday in the Victorian period then, yeah? That's right, it certainly would. I mean, this forge is actually geographically at the centre of the parish. Right. Um, and it's equidistant for all the people within that parish. Very important. So it's so. dead centre in the village. And it would have been a, a hive of activity and a hive of gossip. Come along in then. The forge was especially important during winter. So this is the uh, this is the old forge. This was when maintenance jobs on the estate were done. Fantastic! Wow. All manner of ironwork was needed, as well as the more day-to-day -day tasks like shoeing horses. What do you think? That's amazing. This is just. Are these? They're not horseshoes, are they? Well, they've been put up hot. They look like they have been put up there hot, don't they? You, know, you can see the scorch marks on the, on the yeah. rafters. Yeah. And it looks like that the, the anvil has been placed here on this ring of stone. Round stone there. This is where the fire would have been in the half behind you. Mm -hmm. Right. What are you looking at up there then, Peter? Well, I'm trying to find the chimney. I mean, <laughs> it yes. seems to be a distinct lack of one. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid that the chimney's been blocked up, so that's going to be one of the many tasks. To help get the forge up and running before Christmas, the team have called in stonemason Paul Arrowsmith. Paul, on this, we'd be very grateful. Certainly. This is our forge. The first job is to assess the chimney. Blimey, it's higher than it looks. The question is, where's the blockage? That's down to the bottom of the blockage. OK, so you want to pull it up and measure it. One. Two. Three. Three. Four. Five yards. Five to the end of the stone. So five yards down is where, exactly? Five yards would be roughly the top of the lintel in the bedroom. Right. So we've got quite a lot of work on our hands here trying to unblock this. I love my job. I think I'm just about going through now. All the way through? Yeah. Excellent. Daylight. Daylight? Daylight. That's great. So what's the next stage then? Now we've got this chimney cleared. The next step is re-establish the masonry back into here to form a hood to take the smoke up into the chimney. So what sort of materials are we going to need to build this then? Well, brick would be good, right? contemporary with the, with the time. So we're going to need quite a few bricks then for this? We will, yes. We'll need right. quite a few bricks to rebuild this back up again. OK, your favourite job, sewing. 
Brilliant. <laughs> I know yeah. you love it so much. <laughs> so much fun. For the Victorian farmer, staving off the cold of winter was a major challenge. So Ruth and her daughter Eve are making useful Christmas presents for Alex and Peter. Warm underwear. Come in looking all sad and tired and cold. The ordinary working people were still making their own flannel underwear at home and really quite simple shapes. Everything I read said that in this Victorian period, men wore full length drawers right, right down to the ankle. So the best thing I thought was really what we want is a very simple trouser pattern, isn't it? Just, just straight. Rural poverty in the 19th century made sewing and mending an essential skill. Girls would start as young as five years old. It was one of the most important parts of any young woman's education, sewing. I mean, when compulsory education comes in, they're all taught at school. So that is his back waist, and then that's his front waist. See, that was only that much, halfway round, doubled. That's a waist that big. That's not particularly big, and then that's going to be pleated in slightly. You know, it looks like he's got a really small waist and a really big bum. <laughs> I mean, I really like sort of rural clothing, ordinary people's clothing. If you go in most museums, what you see is, is the really posh stuff, isn't it? You see all the really beautiful, it's all beautifully displayed. You see the ball gowns and the, you know. What you don't see is the ordinary workaday stuff, because they trashed it. OK, that's one pair of trousers. Cold of winter made it a prime time for jobs that could be done regardless of the elements. Tasked with restoring the forge before Christmas, Peter's come to the estate's brickmaker, Colin Richards. The crust and the air go into it, so it'll take a few minutes to go through. The clay's been mined locally. It'll be processed using a pug mill, powered by the estate's shire horse, Clumper. Well, the pug mill's like a food mixer almost to actually get air into the clay. It makes it into a material which is pliable. You can make the bricks more easy. Constant restoration work is needed on the 1,200-acre estate. So Colin's making 10,000 bricks identical to those used to build the distinctive red brick Acton Scott Hall. Well, we've got to get Colin in, because I think he's getting a little bit too much for Clumper, and he's uh, doing a sterling job there. Do you want some more water in there? Yeah, just a bit. It's, it's getting a bit sticky. <laughs> got Alistair outside pushing the gin, and I've resorted to using my hands because it's so hard to shovel the clay. It's all, it's all going wrong. <laughs> Except... Oh, it is just teetering on the edge. It's tantalisingly It close. is. And there it goes. We now have milled clay. Once the clay's processed, it's ready to mould the bricks, with help from expert Alistair Compton. Basically, a two-part mould. We get some kiln-dried sharp sand, and we use this as a, a releasing agent because it's easy getting the clay into the mould, but <laughs> not so easy getting it out. Sometimes it can be problematic. Right? Forming a clod straight into the mould. Down, you get the bow. Just take the top off. That stops it sticking to the board. Bring her out. This is where you need long thumbs. And that, that is a brick? That is a brick. Right. From here, it's got to be dried. About two weeks later, we'll be able to put it into the kiln, go through the firing process, and you'll get your quality bricks coming out. Brilliant. So we've only got another 999,999 to do. Probably nowhere near as speedy as a professional brick maker by any stretch of imagination. I missed again. 
in Victorian times, a group of eight to ten people yeah. could produce around about ten to twelve thousand a day. So basically, I mean, you've got a, enough bricks there for a large cottage. Yeah. But all I can tell you, it's hard work. Yeah, it, and I suppose quite monotonous as well. Quite repetitive. No, it, well, therapeutic to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what my psychiatrist keeps telling me. <laughs> Ruth and Eve are using the nights to work on the Christmas presents. Winter evenings are so long. What are you going to do? You can't be gardening or, or doing very much with the animals. You can't be doing very much outside at all once it's dark. You know, it's really useful to catch up on these sorts of jobs, which at other times of the year there is no time for, no time whatsoever. The onset of winter means shortening days and falling temperatures on the Victorian farm. Ruth's finishing off Peter and Alex's warm underwear. They've come out quite nice. They certainly look warm. And 10,000 bricks have been moulded to restore the blacksmith's forge before Christmas. Two weeks have passed and the bricks have dried out. Now they must be baked to make them rock hard using a kiln. So how many bricks does this kiln hold? Well, about 7,000, depending on what size bricks we make. Crikey, that's a lot of bricks. Yeah, that's enough to make a small cottage. Right. So every time we fire it, you could effectively build a house. I've got some of the bricks that I've inscribed. Right. Done one for Alex. Right. Where do you want that one? Oh, probably at the bottom. Right. <laughs> Near the fire where it's going to break. <laughs> one for Ruth. Right. One for me. The kiln must be sealed, and Colin has a tried and tested method. Here's the clay. Right. It's a very effective way of sealing it all up. That's the most fun way of doing it as well. And with it being soft, it gets in all those little crevices and makes quite a strong wall, really. It's really good fun, actually. <laughs> Thanks. So far, Colin has uh, resisted the urge to throw the clay at me. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> These eight kiln fires need tending around the clock for five days. Are you quietly confident this is going to go well? Well, whenever we light a kiln, it's an unknown quantity, really, and... Uh, it is a bit nerve-wracking, you know, once you've started, that's it now. The kiln fires 7,000 bricks, but Colin needs 10,000. So he's also attempting a more primitive, old-fashioned method of firing bricks, using a clamp. Here, bricks are simply stacked on a slow-burning fire. Okay, right. They were used in cities, weren't they? That's right, this was a way of bringing the firing process right to the site where the houses were being built. Often you use the clay that was dug from, from the foundations and from the cellars to make the bricks to build the house. Stacks were so long that okay. as the fire moved through the stack, they would actually be unloading at one end whilst the fire was moving through. So it was a continual process. And, you know, they were sometimes 40 feet high. So I'm glad we're not going up 40 feet. <laughs> 
but uh, it gives you an insight as to the amount of work involved in making a clamp. It's very labour intensive. With a clamp, you don't know what's happening inside. <laughs> it's very much when you open this, you know, there's an element of surprise. You hope it's going to work, but until you crack it open, you just don't know. Ruth's discovered a novel Victorian way to keep warm in winter. I came across quite an interesting thing in this lovely little book called Common Sense Clothing. It was written in 1869. And it's got this piece and it absolutely intrigued me when I read this. The charlatine blankets, now so much used, are made of paper with cotton wool between. Oh, well, I'd never heard of such a thing, a charlatine blanket. I suppose, being made out of paper and cotton waste, they just haven't survived. They're the sort of thing that lasts a couple of years and gets in a state, you put it on the fire and burn. And like many things, those at the sort of cheap working end don't get recorded in quite the same way. So I thought it would be really good to have a go at making a paper blanket. Cheap and warm, it says. I mean, I haven't really got a clue. I'm having to sort of make it up because nobody's ever heard of a charlatine blanket. <laughs> Right, that's my pieces of paper. So now I want my cotton wool and I'm going to have to sort of just loosely glue it to this surface. I think I'll start in one corner and move my way down. Cotton wool has been around in Britain for over 400 years. The next layer of paper. So, I'm quite sure how this is going to work. We'll find out. The only thing common sense clothing says about paper being a problem on the bed is that it doesn't breathe. And then the Victorians are very worried about um, not allowing the body to breathe. There'd be new work done on, on the pores of the skin. And they also worried about putting something on the bed that didn't breathe. And it is surprisingly hard to get the needle through. It's been three days and nights since the kiln was lit. Peter and the brick team have been continually stoking the fires. Alex is joining them for the final night of the kiln vigil. OK, grubs up, guys. Hi, Alex. What do you mean, grubs up? They're raw potatoes. They are indeed, mate, but you're the one with the oven. <laughs> Shall I take that cider? Yeah, take that cider. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Right, so what's the idea with the potatoes, then? Slam it in. See, this is the sort of thing that over 150 years ago, Victorian brickmakers would have done. Oh, that's right, because this is a big oven, really. You've got the fire, you've got your shovels, and you've got all the embers. Yeah. So you use that to cook your meal. So that's your brick. Oh, I'm liking it. Just stick it in, and then just fold it over. Wow! It's like a potato brick pasty. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. The thickness of a brick is just perfect. It leaves the skins intact and a lovely taste in potato. There we go. Stoking the fires day in, day out has raised the temperature of the kiln to around a thousand degrees. It's very hot. Like you wouldn't believe, really. It is incredibly hot, isn't it? You're the one who's had sleep. Blimey, that, that is just crazy. That just demonstrates how hot this thing is. Well, it, it also emphasises we're, we're not playing at this. You know, this is, these are real forces that we're dealing with, with the fire and the earth and uh, the clay. And we have to be mindful of what's happening all around us. Job done? Yeah, that's the last one in. Right. And I'm... <laughs> Hooped. I'm knackered. I've only Hot. put eight potatoes in there. <laughs> but what do you reckon, an hour then? Yeah, an hour, almost to the minute. I'm going to have to lose this jacket, I think. Yeah. I'm roasting. Until you walk away from the kiln, and then you are freezing. Having prepared for the cold of winter, 
Ruth turns her attention to the long, dark nights leading up to Christmas. Now that the nights have really begun drawing in, this has become a weekly task, cleaning, maintaining all the oil lamps, and indeed the candles too, the, all the artificial light. The glass on the mantles gets really, really dirty, and of course, if I don't clean it, then obviously the light can't come out, and we get dimmer and dimmer and dingier and dingier and dingier. As I always find a bit of vinegar on the cloth helps when I'm doing this. You also have to trim the wicks. If you don't get off all the sort of old wick, it doesn't burn very bright. So I use my lovely little trimmers here and just take off anything that's a bit old and burnt. This was the way most rural homes were lit until the 1930s, when the creation of the national grid brought electricity to most corners of Britain. Managing of light, such a central thing. Oil lamps, they're a good deal brighter than a candle lamp, and it doesn't blow out. So you find that there are quite a lot of things that you can get on with. Nothing that needs really close looking at. But you can read by oil lamp. You can sew by oil lamp, but not maybe the finest of stuff. For fine sewing and lace work, the Victorians had an ingenious solution. A blown glass bowl filled with water acted as a lens to focus the candlelight on the work. Oh, oh, I can see it on my arm. It's like a bit like playing with mirrors when you're a child, a little flashing the light around the room. <sighs> How many more hours is it going to take? While the potatoes cook in the kiln, Alex and Peter check on the brick clamp. This has to be one of the most bizarre sights I've seen. It looks like one enormous brick on fire. <laughs> we say enormous, this is small. With this clamp, whilst it's maybe cheaper to set up, it's not something you can tend. You've got no control over this. Yeah. <laughs> that is really going out the back of my throat now. <coughs> Blimey. Imagine being, imagine being in London in the 1850s, 1860s. The only way that <coughs> Britain was going to build these vast, expanding industrial centres is if it could find a cheap and economic way to build the homes for all the labourers and the workers. Imagine a lifetime of this. <coughs> it would have been pretty short. <coughs> I don't know. You wouldn't have lasted very long, would you? No. Life expectancy in Britain's cities was just 40 years. The whole of the city would constantly be covered in this smog. Yeah. You get that real sort of, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes, Jack the Rippery type of feel from this, don't you? Yeah. You can imagine these kilns burning on the sort of suburbs and outskirts of these growing industrial cities and smoke pouring down the streets. And this is a tiny, tiny clamp compared to what they were building. I mean, there's a half a mile long, 40 feet high. They must have produced some smoke. They must have done. Why are we whispering? I want to wait for Mr. Acton up again. Let's have these potatoes out then. An hour has passed since the potatoes went in the kiln. Looking good. There we go. It's red hot, it's red Ooh. hot. I feel like a surgeon. Oh, ho, ho, you beauty. Look at that. Ready to receive the butter. Butter made on the farm, no less, Peter? Yes, butter made on the farm. There we are. It doesn't get better than this, chaps, does it? Colin, this one yours? Right, Got your name on it. Nice. Yes, sir. There's your fork. How does that taste then? It's great. Yeah, the, uh, I think the clay around the edge, you know, sort of adds something to it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's really nice. <laughs> oh, that's a stone. <laughs> 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 so it's got a nice texture then, has it? <laughs> Tell you what, Alex, this will taste a darn sight better once you've done some work. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, but you should have some of that. But how are the bricks doing? 
and if we look in the fire hole, you can see they're sort of going from sort of yellow to white. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Those ones right in the middle, yeah. yeah. And that's where we want to be at this stage. It's taken us four days and four nights to get to this point. Right. But we've got to hold that temperature for about 12 hours to ensure that it soaks through the kiln. Mm -hmm. To miss this stage of it would mean that all that work and effort is gone to waste. The team work to maintain the intense temperature of the brick kiln until dawn. If they fail, their plans to have the forge in use by Christmas will be scuppered. Away from the kiln, temperatures are dropping. Ruth heads off to bed. a cheap solution to keep him warm, this. It feels, it's quite a surprising thing once made up. It feels, um, well, it feels like one of those padded envelopes that you send through the post. And actually, thinking about it, some of the older ones are actually full of cotton, aren't they? Mind you, I bet the bubble wrap ones would be warm, too. I'm sleeping in an envelope. <laughs> Oh, well, I certainly feel nice and warm at the moment. Hope it stays like that all night. For the last few nights, Peter's had nothing but the brick kiln and cider to keep him warm. Now, it's over. Done it. We've done the kiln. Four nights, five days, all over. Um, it, 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 all too, too little there. sleep. Too much heat. Yeah, too yeah. much work. This is the closest I ever get to working as a Victorian, and it's tough. It is so tough. Whoa! The team must wait a week for the kiln to cool before opening it. Only then will they know if their efforts have been successful. Working outside all hours in all weathers took a toll on the Victorian farmer. Pneumonia, rheumatism and asthma were all exacerbated by the cold. And in the countryside, although better off than in the cities, you couldn't expect to live much beyond 50. But the Victorians had concoctions to combat common winter ailments. This one's a gargle for a sore throat, and you start with sage. Sage is an important medicinal herb. Its Latin name, salvia, means to heal. It's great stuff, sage. It turns up in loads of different remedies. Things like rubbing on the joints for arthritis to try and take down the swelling, lots of cough and cold things, and anything to do with well, anything to do with something that's swollen and sore. So, the recipe says a pint of boiling water, but I haven't got very much sage here, so I'm just going to do well, about a cup, I think. Homemade remedies were sort of, for many Victorians, pretty much the only way they could get hold of medicine. Um, although there were an increasing range of medicines available to buy, uh, that's the point, they were to buy. But for the ordinary little lumps and bumps of life, it made a great deal more sense to make your own home remedies if you possibly could. Right, now that's supposed to stand for half an hour, and you can see already that the water is slightly coloured by the sage. Once that has cooled down, then the only things that got to go in it are vinegar, not too much, just a tiny bit. And I suppose the warmth of the water helps it to sort of evaporate. And then the other thing it's supposed to be is honey. And the recipe just says to taste. So it's to make it palatable. But it's also supposed to help soothe the insides of the throat lining. You're supposed to gargle with it. Let's just try a little bit. Excuse me if I'm disgusting and gargle and spit it out. Oh, 
that's quite nice, actually. <laughs> mm. After a good night's sleep, the boys catch up with stonemason Paul think? Arrowsmith of the forge. If there was a lintel that would have carried the masonry above, that would not work as a flue. They've unblocked the yeah. chimney, but they still have to wait for the bricks to cool before rebuilding it. The floor will also need relaying. And Paul spotted another vital component that's missing. Ah, right. So you'd have bellows yeah. on the outside of this, this wall. That's yeah. another sore point, actually, for us. Bellows. bellows. Yeah. To work iron, they'll need bellows to blow air through the fire, raising the temperature to over 1,500 degrees. If they're to complete the forge before celebrating Christmas, there isn't a second to lose. I don't think I've ever had too much fun, that's the big said. But there's no telling how deep these holes are. No. <laughs> Haven't we taken on too much? Still, we can't let the Actons down. No. The search for bellows takes them to the far reaches of the Acton Scott estate. Can't feel below my navel, Dusty. Oh. It's not like the old vault sprung door technique, is it? Go on, dear. Oh, not what we need. This is what we're looking for. Let's get that under there. I mean, without this kit, our forge is... Well, it's not a forge, is it? Well, it's a fire, basically. <laughs> yeah. Think you can move that on your own? <laughs> Probably. Well, my back is playing me. It always is, Alex. One, two, three. Okay, I'm up. I'm up. You see, in the, in the modern age, you wouldn't be allowed to lift these sorts of weights, but because we're in Victoriana, yeah. obviously we'd be expected to do it. Right. Thank you. Perfect. Right. Good boy, Dusty. Come on. Working in exposed areas at the mercy of the elements gave rise to another common winter ailment for the Victorian farmer. Chillblains, painful, itchy sores on fingers and toes. Ruth's found a recipe that should prevent them. Chillblains are something that farmers were particularly prone to because you're out and about in all weathers and in and out of cold water all the time. So that's my egg broken up and that's got to be whisked and beaten really strongly with a mixture of oil. And I'm going to whisk it up into a bit like an emulsion. It's almost like making mayonnaise, this bit. It needs to be really quite thoroughly mixed. Not as thoroughly as mayonnaise, but nonetheless, somewhere along those lines. And now I can start dripping in my other ingredients. This is the turpentine. So just a tiny spot to start. And then some vinegar. Next thing is spirits of wine. Well, that's just distilled wine, otherwise known as brandy. And then finally, perhaps the oddest ingredient, camphor. Well, I wasn't going to go to the shop and buy camphor specially. So I'm going to use small moth balls. Whoops! As well as repelling moths, camphor has a cooling and anaesthetising effect on the skin. Now, once I've mixed this, I'm supposed to put it into a little airtight bottle and shake 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 and shake. So inside the bottle, Hopefully, it's turning into something that's going to be a little bit closer in texture to mayonnaise. And that's good because it makes it easy to rub on your chillblains or the areas where you might get chillblains. I feel a bit like I'm shaking a cocktail, frankly. <laughs> Not so glamorous, though, is it? Chillblain preventative. This thing. That's it. Give it a smell, make sure it's the right one. Ruth's found a guinea pig for her latest concoction. Uh, that's uh, mothballs, maybe with a, a touch of brandy. <laughs> it has got mothballs in it. Looks a bit like silver polish. Stinks. 
<laughs> but probably not as much as me. <laughs> With the preparations for winter nearly complete, the countdown to Christmas can begin in earnest. Alex is trying his hand at decorating wrapping paper, using a favourite technique of the era. Often, Victorian books were bound with marbled end papers, and he's attempting to reproduce the effect. OK, so I've prepared now the solution um, within which we're going to drop in our inks. This is carrageen moss, OK, so it's like a seaweed. And what this helps to do is really just to sort of thicken up the water. So now for the pigments. These are made up with pigment powders and linseed oil. And it's critical to have an oil-based paint because the oil will sit on top of the water. So that when we apply the paper, that oil-based paint is going to stick to it. I'm just trying to get a nice even distribution of each colour. This has really sort of demonstrated for me what a Victorian Christmas was all about, this sort of level of preparation, because the Victorians really threw everything into Christmas. They really did. And on that goes, on that goes, we can see. I can use these first dummy ones to, uh, to wrap Peter's present in. While Alex's wrapping paper dries, Ruth calls on food historian Ivan Day to make a special treat for the Christmas banquet. So, sweeties, what sort of sweeties are we making? We're going to actually make some lozenges out of sugar paste, which is flavoured with things like ginger and peppermint oil and rose water. So you get a variety of, of flavours and colourings. And um, we've got powdered sugar. Powdered sugar, yeah. And we're going to put into it about half an ounce of what is called gum dragon. Gum dragon, derived from prickly Middle Eastern shrubs, swells in water, forming a stiff gel. That's Lovely. Now, once the gum starts to sort of dissolve into the sugar, it should turn into something that looks a bit like chewing gum. But what we have got, which is really great, are these. Yeah. You rotate it and cut. Rotate it and cut. And you can make a stack all at once. And it's so brilliantly because designed. It's a, yeah, because it's a cone, they're not going to stick. They you all drop get out the end. your little uh, tablets that like that. But as ever, when it came to Christmas, the Victorians added a fun-loving twist. We're going to actually make some motto sweeties with these wonderful little mid-19th century prints where you've got questions like, can you like me? And on there it might say... I do not. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how it was used, but they are I the do. precursors of those little love heart sweets you know, oh, that yeah, you buy know. nowadays. So what we're actually making are Victorian love hearts, if you like. And then it's a case, really, of Just here. Just press in. Peel them off, and you've got your perfect little Victorian love hearts. <laughs> These would be perfect for Christmas crackers because they're <laughs> part of that fortune cookie type of tradition, tradition really. Yeah. It's fun and games, yes, really. Yes, absolutely. At last, the brickmaker's moment of truth has arrived. After a gruelling firing, we've left this for a week to cool down because the bricks inside would have been red hot. And now it's time to crack open our brick kiln and see how we've done. So, as a veteran of these kilns, how are you feeling about this one? Well, each firing is different and uh, it depends on the, the conditions, the temperature, you know, around when we actually fired it. And at the beginning of the firing, we had some pretty bad weather. We had a lot of wind, a lot of rain. Until we opened the door, we just don't know. Despite the bad weather, the majority of the kiln bricks seem to have fired well. Ah, 
That's a nice brick. Huh. Uh, that's the one we wanted to work. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Good. Whoa! You all right, Alex? Yes. How are these bricks looking then? Really, really good. There's nothing like a good handmade brick, is there? And it'll give our forge as well some proper Victorian character. Next, the clamp. Here, the bricks were simply stacked on coal and left to burn. But how do they compare to the kiln bricks? They're, yep. pr they're pretty hot, these ones. Well, they sound good. That means they're cooked. Oh! <laughs> My gloves must be thicker than yours. <laughs> they are very hot. One of the things that makes handmade bricks and hand-fired bricks so interesting is the variety of colours you get, depending yeah. on where they are in the clamp. Perhaps slightly more irregular, and you get the risk of having a lot more that are perhaps overfired near the fuel source. Mm. But what would I do with an overfired brick in the building process? It, they'd be seconds. And right. so if you were building a sort of prestigious house, you know, you'd perhaps use those in partitions or where they wouldn't be seen. But if it was a humble cottage and you'd be buying them cheaply from the brick maker, you'd use them. It's clear there are far fewer properly fired bricks produced by a clamp than a kiln. Fused together. Yes. But they'll come apart. But this is offset by a huge advantage. It's far more economical because, as you saw, we only had a bed of coal four inches deep to fire all these bricks. The clamp uses less than a tenth of the fuel of the kiln per brick. So how are you feeling about this clamp? I'm really pleased, yeah. It's uh, now at the end of the firing to actually get bricks out, which you can use straight away, and they're nice colour, nice shape, and, you know, they're very durable. I'm dead chuffed. I think you should be very proud, although we're dirty again. Thank you, yeah, again. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the Victorian age, the simple clamp had gone out of favour, replaced by the less fuel-efficient but more reliable brick kiln. Finally, the team have the bricks they need to rebuild the forge chimney. Ruth's continuing her Christmas preparations. The sweets have hardened, and historian Peter Kimpton is going to help her ensure the festivities go with a bang. Yes, hello, pleased to meet you. <laughs> hello, well, come on in. Thanks very much. Shall I move some of these lovely, delicious sweeties out of the way? So we've got these pieces of crepe paper here. You need so to put the longer piece on the inside. So Why do I need two bits? That's the way the Victorians used to do it. Oh, it's always two layers, is it? Yes, mm -hmm. and the inner layer they tended to call the petticoat. It just has a lady's petticoat goes <laughs> under petticoat her dress. dress. Crackers were dreamt up in 1847 by an entrepreneurial confectioner called Tom Smith. Taking the shape of a French bonbon, he placed sweets inside cardboard tubes and wrapped them as a festive surprise. Okey doke, and now's a rolling up time. Right. But his first designs failed to make an impression. What he needed was a spark of inspiration. The traditional story is that um, he was sitting in front of the fire one day and one of the logs gave off a pop. Mm. And um, it was the eureka moment. He thought, ah, <laughs> if I could have a pop in my crackers... Everybody would buy them! Exactly. And there are a number of people along the way who claim to have invented what we call the snap. These snaps were actually known about, believe it or not, in 1813. Mm. Adding the snap perfected the Christmas cracker. In about 1861, he launched it on the market and he called it um, Bangs of Expectation. Bangs of Expectation! <laughs> see. see. I mean, if you look in his 1891 catalogue... Look at that giant cracker right. there. Mm. An immense cracker, two feet three inches long! It's yes. a very, very commercial thing, this, isn't it? Yes. Bought decorations, bought sweets, bought... 
crackers. They were very good at responding to what was going on In at a given place. time. Yes. I'll tell you what was a good one they used to do. They used to do crackers for spinsters. Yeah. Crackers for bachelors. Bachelors. Uh, and crackers for married couples. And in the spinsters, they used to have things like faded flowers. Oh, no! False teeth. Oh, that's really mean! A, a wedding ring. <laughs> oh, how horrid. That's really mean, yes, that it does is. Seem that's unkind, horrid. Horrid, it? horrid, horrid. The Christmas celebrations are fast approaching, and time's running out to complete the forge. So, armed with their Victorian bricks, the team crack on with the chimney. Do you want to lay the first brick? Into this corner yeah, here, yeah? and square with the board. First brick laid. Second brick laid. They're going up quickly. Yes, a lot, lot quicker than they did than it was to make them. This takes me back to my childhood, this does. Was your father a blacksmith? No, no, I used to play with legos. It was lots, lots of bricks. I was good. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, do you want to come in? Yeah, let's have a look. Four days later, the chimney's complete. It's such a simple building material, I didn't realise how much effort went into making bricks. It's really lovely and smooth. Yeah. It really is. That's a cracking job. Well, hopefully this will just draw all the smoke up. And, um, yeah, we'll have a working forge. Yeah, I'm really impressed, mate. They've got a fireplace, but to work iron, right. they'll need the bellows. What do you think, Peter? Uh, spin it here. Oh, we'll pop it down. Mate, there we are, Skid. Should we give it the candle test? Yeah, give it the candle test. Let's see if it blows have, it have out. A, have a pump. Look at that. Time to add the finishing touches. Blacksmith's forges had solid clay rather than stone floors. Clay deadened the sound of beating metal, and it wouldn't be damaged by dropped tools. There we go. Brilliant. Bucket of lime next. Bucket of lime. Gravel and lime added to the clay's resilience. <coughs> and the Victorians congealed it with a special ingredient. Bull's blood. mixes nicely. Probably the same way that they crush grapes for bull's blood wine or uh, Taurus Diablo or something. What are you going on about? I have no idea. <laughs> <sighs> Just make sure I don't fall over. That wouldn't be nice. Peter, how's it going? It's going well, oh. but it's hard work. Looks like a mugs game to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should uh, show him how it's done. I Ruth. think so. I think we have a cunning plan here. Oh, yeah. They involve clogs, <laughs> dancing, and some ale. Yeah. Get your clogs on then, Peter. <laughs> Clog dancing was a common Victorian method to beat down clay floors. Wooden soled clogs with a steel toe capped boots of the age. Mill workers would stamp their clogs to the rhythm of the weaving machines to keep warm. Clog dancing was born. <laughs> Phil Howard's an expert in the history of clog dancing. So have you ever come across clogs being used to stamp down a floor? Well, it's, it's a variation on a theme, cos uh, every single canal around the country was done with tamp clay. And the navvies used to sort of walk up and down and stamp it down and use the spades and such like. And then the Capability Brown actually used a herd of cows, <laughs> which is pretty much <laughs> similar. And of course, it is too small. So I think this is pretty similar to a herd of cows coming <laughs> well, I in. Think and some of our dancing was a bit like a herd of cows. <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter. <laughs> I'm glad you put my name first. <laughs> well, here's a toast to the forge and all who helped build it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. After six weeks of back-breaking work, the forge is restored to its Victorian glory. It's nearly Christmas on the Victorian farm. Ruth Goodman, Peter Ginn, Big Tree, and Alex Langlands are putting on a banquet for the entire estate. There's a huge amount of preparation to do, but work on the farm doesn't stop just because it's Christmas. Oi, Dumper. Whoa! There are Victorian favourites to rediscover. This is exactly the method that Bob Cratchit's wife yeah. would have used to cook her Christmas pudding. Yeah, it's mentioned, yeah. isn't it, in yeah, the Christmas yeah. Carol? Last minute shopping to do. This is real nose pressed against the glass thing. And gifts to make. That's it oh, now. Lovely. Hit it. Oh! <laughs> if all goes to plan, they can enjoy the Christmas feast with their landlord, Mr Acton, and the people of the Acton Scott estate. So here's to hard-working Victorian, hard Victorian farmers. Cheers. Wherever they may be. <laughs> Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen. In just three days, the team will celebrate Christmas on the Victorian farm. And at the heart of the Victorian Christmas was charity. In the church, their landlord's son, Rupert Acton, shows Alex an example of this seasonal generosity. The charity that we had in Acton Scott is, is this one. Before the advent of the welfare state, private individuals would give money to charities and there would be a sum of money paid out to the poorest people in the village. So this is a common way then of, of just uh, making sure that everyone knows that the poor have got a stock and, and they've got some, some charity being given to them every year. That's right. So what can we do then to recreate something of the sort of Victorian charity? Well, the records show that they were holding a party for the tenants and the servants. That's something that would, um, I'm sure, go down very well right. with uh, the people in the parish. So you're happy to stomp, stomp up the, the cash for the location, Certainly. some of the food. Yes. Uh, yeah. If I go out and maybe get a Christmas tree. You're welcome to do that. In Victorian times, landlords would host a Christmas feast, but it was down to the tenants to do the hard work of preparing it. Time short, so Ruth's drafted in food historian Ivan Day to help. First, the Christmas pudding, boiled in the washroom's copper. This is exactly the method that Bob Cratchit's wife yeah. would have used to cook her Christmas pudding. Yeah, it's mentioned, yeah. isn't it, in yeah, the Christmas yeah. Carol? While the water boils, Ruth and Ivan make the pudding. But um, if we're going to make a real traditional Victorian Christmas pudding, what everybody thinks about are those cannonballs that you get on the Christmas <laughs> cards. Yeah, absolutely, really round one. My one last year did not. It, I got it out of the cloth and it just went... <laughs> <laughs> right there, yeah. Now, the one we're going to make is a slightly more old-fashioned recipe. It's from the same author, Eliza Acton, from yeah, the 1840s. I like her food. And what we'll do is we'll make two puddings. We'll make one in a cloth, and we'll also make a very fancy one, which is the sort of thing they probably would have had up at the big house. Oh, that's This is a cake pretty. mold, a lovely... Isn't that pretty? ..19th-century cake mold. You can use it, you can put your mixture in there. OK. Pop when you pudding. see pictures of, of Victorian posh dinner parties, they're full of things like that on the plate, aren't they? They really like those sorts of very elaborate, standy-uppy shapes. 
Like modern Christmas puddings, the Victorian version was packed with expensive ingredients, like dried fruit and candied peel, mixed with flour and suet. But it had an unlikely origin. The earliest Christmas pudding, I think, that was eaten, which we have records of in this country, is something that was called a hackin or a hack pudding. Um, and it had to be ready for Christmas morning breakfast. And what it was, it was like a Christmas pudding mixture that was actually boiled in a sheep's stomach. And everyone, when they hear that, think of the haggis, really. Yeah. And this is really in the haggis family. A Christmas pudding is a sweet haggis, basically. Well, they're often called puddings, aren't they? When you, re you, know, you think of black pudding, you think of um, white puddings, anything that's boiled in a yeah. casing is called a pudding, isn't it? If, yeah, but the, the thing is, though, cleaning out pig's intestines for white puddings or a sheep's stomach <laughs> for a, a haggis job. is a horrible job. So some wag decided to, to boil it in a bag, but the haggis really is the forerunner of the Christmas pudding. So we've got to put in some liquid ingredients, mm -hmm. and of course, the really important one is the brandy wine, or brandy. <sighs> and this is quite interesting because a lot of modern cooks reading this Victorian recipe would see that you have to put four glasses, of it says wine glasses of brandy. And of course, a, a Victorian wine glass... Is that big? Is that big. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll put the spice in. Nutmeg and cinnamon are added to the mixture. That's the smell of Christmas Eve. Drop that in, like that, and just give it a gentle push so that the air comes out. Oh, look at that. Perfect quantity and everything. Yep. <laughs> Not just a pretty face. Not just a pretty face. Yeah. And then for everybody else, you you're form actually it. going to form it into a ball shape. Right, anyway, before it goes so. into yeah, the basin. Yeah. Now, of course, a or pudding cloth is a much better thing than a sheep's stomach. We're going to now tie that, and we'll tie that tightly. OK. Whoa! <laughs> oh, we're definitely boiling. <laughs> pudding time. <laughs> the pudding cooks in the uh. copper. Whoa, look at that is, boiling. Well, there's enough room in there for about six of them, but <laughs> we'll just pop that in there. Perfect. OK, now that is going to have to stay in there for six hours, believe it or not. <sighs> Who said the Victorians didn't have saunas, <laughs> eh? Isn't this nice? Uh, so if we have our anvil there, fire, yeah. tools... Do, do, do. Anvil oh. down here, yeah? Yeah, I think so. Can we get that next? Yeah. Work on the farm doesn't stop for Christmas. <sighs> on the floor here? Yeah, yeah. For the last few weeks, the team's been busy restoring the estate's blacksmith's forge. This was where the estate's ironwork was done, from tools to hinges to horseshoes. Yes. Oh, look at that. Like a glove. <sighs> the success of the forge relies on creating a fire hot enough to soften iron, and that means temperatures of one and a half thousand degrees Celsius. So Peter rebuilt the chimney, while Alex fitted bellows to blow air through the fire. Blacksmith John Herbertson has come to help the boys light the restored forge for the first time in half a century. Hi, John. Oh, hi, John. Hello. How are you going? Uh, well. OK, yeah, the bellows are in. That looks like it's working. Peter's just filling up the, uh, the cooling system. Go. Let's get this up. Blacksmiths use a special type of coal, coke. You can fill it right up because your, your coke is your, your fire, it's also your source of fuel and right. it's your working surface. Right, OK. How's that? That's fine. So here we go, John. This is a, the, the first time this fire hole is going to have seen fire. Of interest in a long time. That's better. I get it in there. Myself and Alex, we've been working really hard to just get this place ready. And uh, it's great to see it finally being used. Very gently, that's OK. Just nurse it. Noisy old bellows, aren't they? It sounds a bit like you snoring, Peter. <laughs> ah, look at that, that's the fire. It's fire. Going. Just don't choke it off, Alex. It's... Yeah. OK, we'll get the coke on the fire now. OK. Just try and, try and leave at least one hole for a tongue of flame to come out. So that's banked up there, John, and I can, I can actually hear there's a different sound now. OK, that's fine, it's fine. But you can give it a bit more welly on the bellows now, Peter. Yep. Bit, bit of elbow grease yes. there. Keep it going. 
It's, keep, they're quite slow filling up. Yeah, never mind the filling up. Pump it and keep that top one high up, almost touching the bar. That's looking pretty healthy now, so you can just keep pumping, Peter. Shove some more coke on it, yep. Alex, and um, that's it. You're away. How are you feeling, Peter? Good, really good. Now the moment of truth. Just how good are the bellows and the chimney? Will the fire get hot enough to soften iron? Most forging, the hotter the better. So right. we're looking for at least yellow. Uh, and frankly, sometimes you want it almost white hot. Don't, uh, like that sort don't of pussyfoot, thing. you won't hurt anything, that's it. I mean, I'm always very oh, yeah. tentative around fires, but you can actually be quite robust. Oh, gosh, yes, yeah, you've got to be. Could it get too hot, though? Yeah, it can burn, right. which we, we're about to do, just to show, there you oh. are, you're burning, wonderful. Well, that really proves the fire is good. But that burning is basically saying to us that we're getting the heat that you, we need. You've got all the heat you can get out of that fire, right, yes. Right, so we've got a working forge yep. now. We just need to pick up the skills. Yes. <laughs> After half a century, the forge is up and running and open for business. Whoa! The Christmas pudding's been boiling for six hours. Uh, it's really like some infernal cauldron. <laughs> so we'll just put it into there and we'll leave it. Okay? Right, let that settle. And uh, let it just firm up a bit before we actually put it onto a plate. Let's get the fancy moulding right, one out All right, OK. First. Well, yeah, I think you should do that one. I don't think I'm... Um... Well, <laughs> it's the most nerve-wracking... Ooh, business. Just turn it upside we, down and hope. So let's just see what happens. Da, 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 da. They don't just drop out usually, they no, take a little bit shake. of persuading. <gasps> and there's a perfect <laughs> Victorian moulded oh, Christmas pudding. Okay. That is spectacular. Yeah, fantastic. That hasn't been done for a long time. <laughs> right. Next, the cannonball. Can you smell that? It's I can. wonderful, I can. isn't it? It smells Fantastic. great. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the plate on and do a sort of Tommy Cooper type thing, but we'll have to do it very gently. OK, and then if I can just lift that off. Now, what we've got to do is just tease off the cloth very Gently like that. And there's your perfect Victorian cannonball. <laughs> as illustrated in all of the, all of the Christmas cards and all of the books. A little sprig of holly. OK. Wonderful! So... Don't they look great? Head down. At the forge, the first customers arrived. The estate's shire horse, Clumper. Right. We ready to go? I'll get him tethered up. Clumper needs reshoeing. A job for a farrier. Tom Williamson is a farrier with over 40 years' experience. His first job is to remove Clumper's old shoes. You know, this building really was, if you like, the beating heart of the village. You know, so much would be going on here. In themselves, the crafts were so important to the village, but of course, at the same time, because everyone was coming here, it was also quite a gossipy place as well. So it really is a kind of a, an essential place in any Victorian village. Horses' hooves are like fingernails, growing up to an inch a month, and this new growth must be removed before fitting new shoes. So, Tom, to shoe or not to shoe, that, that, that is the question. Why, why do you have to shoe horses? The wagon that he pulls, the four-wheel wagon, weighs a tonne before they put anything in it. The pressure and the friction on his feet would be tremendous and he would soon wear them down and he would soon become lame. So to protect the foot from excessive wear, we put a shoe on. If they're not doing that much work, they really do not require shoeing. How's it looking? Fine. Heavy horses like Clumper must be reshod every six weeks with brand new custom made shoes. Into the first bend. Goes cold quite quick. Looks like the devil when it catches you in the eye. And I notice you're doing all these holes by eye. Yeah. Is that something you just get from experience? Hopefully. <laughs> Just make 
making it, taking all the sharp edges off, making it look right. OK, so this is the other side of the shoe. Second bend. And now it's beginning to look like a shoe. Farriers are their own worst enemy. We make the job look very rough and ready. Yeah. But it's got to be absolutely spot on. The Victorian farrier served a four-year apprenticeship to learn these skills. He required not only the craft of the blacksmith, but also knowledge of horse anatomy. A lot of people get me mixed up with the blacksmith. Right. Um, is that sacrilege, is it? It too? is to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a farrier, not a blacksmith. The blacksmith does ornamental metal work, metal fittings yeah. for the wagons and the wheels, or always did. And uh, the farrier, he shoes horses. The blacksmiths are older and uglier than what we are. They've been going for about 4,000 years. Right. Farriers have only been going for 2,000 years. So this system of shoeing horses hasn't altered in 2,000 years. What do you think of our forge? How's it, how's it going so far? Is it all right? Great, yeah, it's going well. <laughs> Ruth and Ivan are busy preparing for the estate's Christmas banquet. Next, the main dish, Christmas pie, packed with four birds, duck, chicken, partridge and pigeon. These are actually made on a huge scale, even being served in Windsor in 1857. A giant one carried by four footmen on a stretcher <laughs> has been taken to Her Majesty's dining room. <laughs> really, in a household like this, of course, Game is something that would not have been experienced very no. often unless it was a gift of the landlord. OK, we've got a hell of a lot of meat to get into this. The four birds go into a pie mould lined with pastry and stuffing. OK, so what we've got here is one hen. So if we drop this guy in like that and just let him overhang... Next, the deboned goose. OK. So we've got two little breasts of pigeon. And let's go for a couple of little breasts of partridge. So that's the partridge. Nice. OK, so there you've got, we've got four birds all inside each other. We've basically got the traditional Christmas pie. Like that, OK. So when you slice the pie, you're going to get, like, rings, aren't you? We'll finish off with a little bit of bacon as a finishing flourish. Then the pie is decorated. Yeah, we're going to use this lovely... It's called a pie board. <laughs> and it's for making little decorative leaves. Like that. Okay, and then, kind of Beautiful final mold, decoration yeah. is this sprig mould, which is in the form of a flower. Just push it in really hard like that, and then... It should, in a perfect world, just pop out. Hey! And there it is. And okay. it did! Okay. Oh, it's really pretty. Pop it on the top. So that's basically the, the Christmas pie. The pie is eaten cold, so once cooked, it'll be kept on the pantry's cold stone until Christmas. How's it looking, then? I think that's about it. Yep, yeah. ready to go? Clumper's new shoes are ready to be fitted. OK, we've got it just about ready. Not too hot. They'll burn on too much. I'll score the foot, so I've got to so be a little bit careful. So you're burning on? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, you'll see, when I go outside, you'll see exactly what we're doing. You're going to put it on hot, right, OK. Good lad. Up, up. The hot shoe burns an impression into the horn of the hoof, showing Tom how well it's fitting. And this doesn't hurt him? Well, as long as we don't do it too much. Way up. He's too tight at the heels. Yeah. He's not too bad at the toe, so we need to open him up at the heels there and there. OK? Yeah. So we're just going to just adjust that a little bit just more. Just a little bit more. Do 
you've got to work quick then, haven't you? Because all the while it's cooling. Cooling metal. down. Yeah. You can't afford to be casual. Shoe has got to be absolutely level. So working this quickly then, how many horses would a Victorian farrier shoe in a day? I should think you probably did at least eight horses a day. Eight horses a day? Yeah. But they did it more of a production line. After final adjustments, the shoe's ready to be nailed to Clumper's foot. Up, up. Come on, Clumps. OK. So you're going to put that into that horse's foot, are you? Yep. There's a right way and a wrong way to put them in. If you go in the wrong way, you'll know about it. You'll go towards the bone. Oh, hold steady. Get up. When done by a skilled farrier, the horse feels nothing. Okay. But there's little margin for error. Stand still. Stand it's you stand there. Well. Driving in a nail at the wrong angle can make a horse lame for life. As the nail comes through the foot, yeah. you have to rip it off pretty quick. That's a long piece of nail. Hammer yeah. goes on, ring it off. Ah! Stand still. Stand, stand there. It's not a small man's game, this, then. Well, a small man, normally, they're very good at this, actually. They don't get so much back trouble in a small man. Right. Stand there, Clumper. And now we can see the amount of growth we've had from one set of shoeing yeah. to another. So you can see where the old nail holes are yeah. in comparison to the to the new ones. So that's roughly sort of six weeks' growth then there. OK, so we better finish him off. Oi! Clumper. Come up. Step on. So you just run your hand across. Yeah. Make sure it's all nice and smooth. And drop him. Drop him down. Well, there we go, fella. <laughs> How many did you say they did a day? Eight a day? They'd be... They'd probably do a few before breakfast, so... <laughs> It's now just two days before the Christmas feast. Oh, it smells absolutely delicious. Ruth and Ivan have already done some food preparation, but there's still plenty more cooking to do, as well as the hall to decorate. Alex is scouring the estate to find a Christmas tree. This is the uh, full complement of the, uh, the woodman's tool, short of a bill hook. I brought them all because it's going to be pretty difficult to get this tree out of here. And I've had my eye on this one here, so I'm hoping it's going to come out easily. It was actually Prince Albert, the consort of Queen Victoria herself, who was responsible for introducing the, the Christmas tree to these shores and he imported in the 1840s trees from Coburg, his native country, to the part of Germany. And in fact, Dickens even refers to Christmas trees as being a German toy that the upper classes were indulging themselves with. Listen. There he is. Beauty. And there we have our Victorian Christmas tree. As well as the Christmas tree, the Victorian age saw the birth of another institution, Christmas cards. Collector Jackie Brown has brought a very special Christmas card from 1843 to show Ruth. Sir Henry Calder, sir, as he became known as. You've got the first Christmas card, haven't you? I have, Ruth. <laughs> Here it is. That's, that's the real thing. This is, The yes. very first Christmas card. Yeah. That's quite impressive, isn't it? It was all sparked by an idea by um, Henry Cole, who became Sir Henry Cole. And uh, he was uh, one of the leading entrepreneurs of the Victorian age. And kind of finding himself a bit pushed for time to do his normal habit of uh, writing letters to all his friends and 
and family at Christmas time, mm. he called in an artist friend of his, uh, John Horsley, and said, could you come up with a good, good image that we could use? Um, which is, uh, which, which is, is this. And it's really interesting. And there's, well, there's no religious imagery there at all, is there? It's all about like, there's the IV decorating the whole area. You've got people sitting down to a big Christmas dinner, drinking loads, eating loads. There's a Christmas pud and lots of wine. And then what are these images? It's of? feeding and clothing the poor and needy. Right, really? so, so charity, family, yes. feasting, yep. decking the halls, not a lot of God. No, and it caused real problems with the, the Puritans of, of the age because they, they took exception to this imbibing of, of alcohol. <laughs> And, um, and actually, uh, for that reason, there are in fact only 10 left in the world. The Puritans went around destroying them, saying that they were bringing down society. Not the true spirit of no. Christmas, as people would still say. Despite the protests, the Christmas card industry boomed. By 1877, in Britain, four and a half million were being sent every year. Christmas shopping also boomed in the Victorian age. Rather than being for necessity, it became a leisure activity. Ooh, look at these pans. Peter and Ruth have come to Blist Hill Victorian town in Colebrookdale for some last minute presents. This is the age of the beginning of the department store. And of course, some of them that were started in Victorian period are still with us. Things like Liberties, Selfridges, Marks and Spencers. This is when they begin with this great explosion of commercial goods. <laughs> A speaking picture book. <gasps> These sorts of really, really beautiful Victorian toys are popping up all over the place at this time in history. It was a great explosion in the amount of toys commercially available to the Victorian purchaser. But only the Victorian purchaser with money, quite a bit of money. These sorts of things were really quite expensive. Upper middle class toys. Nobody working on a farm could possibly afford to buy these for their children. This is real nose pressed against the glass thing. While Ruth window shops, Peter heads to the town's foundry to buy more fuel for the forge. Here, three centuries ago, the extraction of iron from its ore using coke rather than charcoal was perfected. This new efficient method meant iron could be produced cheaply on a huge scale. Cast iron was the plastic of the age, kick-starting the Industrial Revolution. John Challen runs the Blist Hill Furnace that still operates today. What can I do for you? Uh, I'm looking for coke, actually. You're looking at what I've got, aren't you? Excuse my ignorance. What exactly is coke? It's basically, it's basically roasted coal. Right. So you, you get your coal. What you're doing is driving off all the, all the unpleasant bits, all the oily stuff and the, uh, and the tars and everything, and you're left with almost what is pure carbon. Coke had the advantage of burning hotter than normal coal. Quite boring looking stuff, but I don't know if had an impact. This is almost the start of our carbon footprint as we yeah. It's the birth of the Industrial Revolution. It's also the birth of the problems we have now. It is. It's, 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 it's one of them paradoxes, because if you hadn't have done it, there wouldn't have been the volumes of iron around to build your railways, bring the world closer together, you know, ocean-going ships, all that sort of thing. All needed vast quantities of iron, which you wouldn't have got if you were literally growing your fuel on trees. The iron of the Industrial Revolution connected Britain's towns with railways, giving us a far-reaching postal system. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to send some Christmas cards, please. I wonder what sort of stamps I'm going to need. Well, the Christmas card rate will be a halfpenny per card. Oh, that's not too bad, is it? How many have you got? Uh, Dave Gaval of the Blist Hill Post Office believes yeah. this is the reason why Christmas card sales soared in the Victorian age. One, two, it's really quite cheap, isn't three, it? four, five. Yes, it is cheap because in 1870 the new postal rate was introduced, which meant now that you could send Christmas cards for the price of a postcard, which was a halfpenny. Prior to that, it would have been costing you a penny. 
absolute boom in the amount of Christmas cards. And at this sent. rate, it really is something that every working class person was in a position to afford, isn't it? It makes being able to communicate over long yeah. distances. Yeah. Really in the reach of everybody now. And when you think about the world being made smaller by mass communications, this is where it starts, isn't it? With the post, With the post office. office. This is the first great leap of making the world all interconnected. Oh, yes, it was so very important. Well, thanks ever so much. Thank you for your business, madam. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too. Take me home, Ruth. How's it going? Very well, Peter. Very well. It's getting complicated. More coke. Yep. More coke. Excellent. Good. Good. We'll need that. Got a quarter ton. Shop bought okay, presents really were too expensive for Victorian farm workers to afford, so Alex and Peter have had an idea. What we're doing is we've constructed this forge and we want to do something with it. So we thought, what, what would be better than giving the Actons a Christmas present from our very forge? So we're going to make them a door knocker. Okay. And go. Right. Good. You just have the nice, gentle, relaxing strokes of the bellows and the sound of the fire, and then it comes out and it's like furious Frantic. hammer and tongs, and then uh, in it goes again, and you can just relax that, a little that, bit. That, and that's the origin of the expression then, going at it hammer and tongs. Yes. yes. Bang, 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 bang. Okay, quick, good. So I suppose I mean it's quite easy to think of a blacksmith as a guy who just smacks metal, but it's it's quite hard to really picture the real versatile kind of sort of range of jobs he would have done. Blacksmithing was the king of all crafts. But once the village had its blacksmith, then the carpenters could have metal tools to cut the wood with. Um, there could be implements for the fires, implements for the houses, everything made. And the blacksmith was the man who did it, so he, he really was the, the leader of the pack. I think somebody mentioned pulling out teeth. Oh, oh, yeah. I Dentistry. He, well, he was the man that would uh, have the tongs. I don't think I'd like this blacksmith going at my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> How's it looking, Peter? Looking good. So we're ready. Next, the critical moment. Joining together the two main parts. Peter's got just one chance to get it right. In like that. Get it in, shove it in. OK, now start snapping it or bending it. Keep it keep it in, keep it in. Don't let it pop out. That's oh, it now. Lovely. Hit it. Oh! oh. Right, wait, wait. 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 Get it. Uh. <laughs> oh, no. Have you got it? Yeah. Right, just drop it in. Drama. Drama. Drama in the forge. For centuries, homes at Christmas were decorated simply with greenery, like holly and ivy. The Victorians changed all that with brightly coloured decorations. <laughs> Debbie Banford's come to show Ruth how the Victorians created brilliant colours, not from chemicals, but from nature. <laughs> so we're going to start off doing the yellow, right? which is this plant here. Nice. Weld plant. Right. Now, this plant has actually been used for putting yellow colour into textiles for at least 3,000 years. Oh, good grief. <laughs> so, so it's we quite think, well we think tried and tested then. Yeah, we think it'll work. So, what do I do with it? Just chop it up? You just literally use stem, flowers, leaves, the whole lot except the roots. Okay, so we've right, got loads so of we've weld. Got loads of weld. Chopped up. Tie it up in a in little a bag. bag. So what we need to do with this bag now is put it into some hot water. OK, so bag just goes in bag there. Bag just goes in there. Now, we have a no. crucial element that really needs to go in with the weld. Mm. And that's this one here. Hold your nose. This is stale urine. Oh, lovely. So you're ready to hold your nose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe urine is essential to fix the really colour to the fabric. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> blanking heck, you can't, can't you? <laughs> oh. Straight at the back of the throat. It really is. 
Time for the ribbons to go into dye. Okay. One of those and one of those. Oh, da -da -da -da. And then, yeah, put another couple in. It needs to be on the heat now for a good three quarters of an hour. And then we can do another colour. Ooh. For the red, there's something more exotic from South America. So these are they're, they're the cochineal beetles. Yeah, you yeah, see. Yeah, 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 you can see the little you tiny insects. Little, it's almost like mini little, little wood lice -y things. Well, effectively, that's what they are. They just kind of live on the trees, on the cactus. And that's what cochineal is. And that's what is. cochineal is. It's, it's just a it's ground the up. the female beetle. Beat your beetles to yes. a paste or powder. The dead beetles must be ground up to release their colour. Cochineal's what's used for the British Army red coats. Oh, is it? Yep, that's how we get our really nice shiny red. The thin red line the thin is red all line. about dead it's beetles. All about dead beetles. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, oh, it's quite red already. It look. Is. So just so you, in there. Yeah, just tip it in there. Yeah, you can put some ribbons in. <laughs> I like this bit. Finally, blue. It's from an Indian plant called Indigofera and it comes in in lump form and we crush it up and mix it with stale urine <laughs> and let it ferment nicely for a while. <laughs> Everything's with stale Everything. urine. It's Everything's a crucial urine. commodity. <laughs> Leave it out in the air and see it turn blue. And then this is going to change colour? It will actually change colour. If you keep watching it, can you see? You keep oh. watching. Oh, yes, it is. It's more turquoise now. It was definitely green before. You had me worried. We just leave it out in the it. air. We just leave it out in the air, yeah. So I just drop it over my clothes yeah. area. Compressing a four-year blacksmith apprenticeship into an afternoon is proving a challenge for Alex and Peter. It's not going brilliantly. Um, it is slaving over a very, very hot fire. Yeah. You do get burnt on a regular basis. <laughs> my hand wasn't used to the hammer, so I've managed to give myself two giant blisters on my hand. Peter must bend the rod of iron into a perfect circle to form the knocker. A bit more bend there. It's a pretty misshapen old bit of uh, kit there. Um, get it, get it really hot. In theory, you get it so hot you could almost do it with your bare hands. Um, there's a good reason for not doing it with your bare hands, but, but use a hammer instead. The sort of consistency. It, is, of, it, of it would almost be soft enough. Yes. Don't oh. spoil it. Okay. Now the moment of truth. Time to assemble the knocker. So this is going to be the real test now. This one. This is the difficult bit. That's why I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, have, I have full trust in our man. Baptism of fire. Yep. Why not? To split that out. It's fine. There we are. OK. So. That's it, that's it, that's it. OK, let's turn it up now onto that side and start encouraging that thing to go through. Let's see, is that going through? Yes. Tense moments here. <laughs> Slightly off. It has a certain charming asymmetry, <laughs> which I can't quite put my finger on. <laughs> the shorter taking it apart, yeah, there's very little we can do. Very we can do about it. It is a Christmas present. They'll probably have had sherry. I reckon that'll look pretty straight to them on the day. <laughs> <laughs> The yellow and red ribbons have been boiling in the dye for an hour. It's yeah, not too sure hard. Are you all right? Yeah. It's time to see if the process has worked. Yeah. Okay. There <gasps> we go. That is yellow, isn't it? Just give it a bit of I think that comes out of a plant, just pure and straight. Oh, I know, a, and plant a plant and some wee. That's actually a weed. We just chop it down and throw it away normally. Just give it a bit of. Oh, I think the cochineal actually smells more. Mm, well, that more. looks strong. Oh, good grief. <laughs> oh, good grief. Oh, <laughs> That's quite a colour, isn't it? That's the colour of Christmas, that is. 
It's the day before the feast. The farmers are busy with last minute preparations. The presents are wrapped using Ruth's coloured ribbons. And the cooking's well in hand. Here we go. So we'll just slam these in here for about half an hour. Tomorrow's feast will take place here in the village hall. The Victorians would put their decorations up as late as Christmas Eve, not weeks in advance like today. Alex's Christmas tree is in place, and Peter's decorating it with sweets and candles. Big tree. Big decorations. I think we're going to struggle to get a star on top of this. Well, uh, Alex has volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these Christmas decorations that we've been making, of, of the way to make them, the instructions have all come out of um, magazines of the period, Christmas issues usually, um, which give advice on how to make your home beautiful at this time of year. I'm melting a load of sealing wax because we're going to make our own holly berries. If we haven't got quite enough, this is recommended in Castle's Household Guide as how to make your own artificial holly berries. You melt a load of nice bright red sealing wax and then you cover peas in them. Come on, get covered. My little holly berries. This is really quite a towny thing to do. I mean, out here in the countryside, it's, it's relatively easy to get fresh holly berries. But in the few we lived in the town, full of coal smoke, it was pretty hard to get greenery and seasonal colour to decorate the house, so people made artificial ones. I'm going to stick a wire in so that we can attach them to whatever it is we want our holly berries on. One little teeny holly berry. I've chosen to do a Christmas motto um, and essentially it's a kind of friendly Christmas greeting for when uh, people enter the hall. It's got to be in a prominent position and I've meticulously cut all this out and um, using the good old flour and water to make myself a paste to stick on the letters. Now all I now have to do is to make sure they're nice and straight. Uh, the recommendation for this motto is to decorate each individual letter with pieces of rice so that the letters are entirely covered by rice. But uh, anyone who's got that much time on their hands clearly isn't a farmer. I'm following another Victorian trick for decorating. That's, I suppose it's a bit like glitter. I'm gluing ground or crushed glass on the edges of um, my leaves and things to imitate snow. Look at that, all glittery. I think this one's the prettiest though, I like this one. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It looks like something you'd get out of a sort of modern retailer's shop, wouldn't it? In a special tacky sort of way. Yes, and of course we have the Victorians to blame for tackiness, not being renowned for their taste. And there we are, Christmas welcome to you. Oh, no, I've glued it to the table. <laughs> 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 the big days finally arrived. But even at Christmas, the Victorian farmer was up at the crack of dawn to tend to his animals. To feed Clumper, they're using the hay harvested back in July. Right, should we get some of that hay down? Yes, let's get some of that well-earned hay down. It fills me with great pride to be able to, uh, to feed him some of our own, very own hay. It's one of those 
sort of special moments on the farm, really. Is that enough then, Peter? That's plenty of it. That's definitely a double ration for Christmas. Yeah. Well, Merry Christmas, Clumper. You've certainly earned it. Merry Christmas. Get out of the way. Right. Get stuck in. There is a Christmas tradition that you always give a double ration on Christmas Day. And this isn't uh, really down to generosity at all. It's just that, uh, so when it comes to Christmas evening and you've had too much to drink, you don't have to worry about going out and feeding the animals. So that's their Christmas ration for the day. Come on then. Chip, 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 chip. Let's spread some grain out on the floor so that they're going to spend their day pecking happily. This is traditionally a day as well in which Perhaps even if you only do it the one day of the year, you actually feed the wild birds too. People just felt it was the time for goodwill to all God's creatures. So sparrows and blackbirds were fed when perhaps the rest of the year, the only time they would be fed is if you were trying to catch them to eat them. Hello, princess. Hello, princess. One of Britain's leading experts in folklore, Professor Ronald Hutton, has come to the farm to celebrate Christmas. Here's a health unto Snowdrop and to her great horn. Pray God He's joining the people of Acton Scott in the stables for an ancient tradition. All over Europe, from the beginning of time, people have blessed their homes and their farms at midwinter to bring them luck for the coming year. Drink unto thee, drink unto thee. With a morsel in bowl, we'll drink unto thee. And, here's unto and the southern English way of doing this is called wassailing, and it simply means singing to and drinking to your farm produce. So if you're a fruit grower, you sing to your apple trees. If you're a cereal farmer, you sing to your cornfields. And if you raise livestock, you sing to them. Drink unto thee, drink unto thee. With a wassail in bowl, we'll drink unto thee. Drink unto thee, drink unto thee. With a wassail in bowl, we'll drink unto thee. Before the Christmas feast, Alex, Peter and Ruth have been invited to Acton Scott Hall for drinks with the Acton family as thanks for their work on the estate. Mm. Same they've got a fire going in there. <laughs> Ah, oh. hey, welcome. Hello, Mr. Acton. Hello, Mr. Acton. Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mr. Acton. Merry Christmas, Mr. Acton. Merry Christmas, Mr. Acton. Hello, how are you? It's a rare opportunity for the Victorian farmers to see the inside of the big house. Here, the Acton children are playing with the very finest toys of the age. Yes, and then the fox has to eat. Then the fox has to eat. I can't, I can't. This ingenious book of animal noises dates from the 1850s. Two, five, six, right, this is how this book works. In order to produce the sound, gently pull out the cord. Stand. <laughs> pretty lifelike, I think. <laughs> but these sort of elaborate gifts were only for the privileged few. For most ordinary Victorian children, of course, it was whatever your mum and dad could make for you out of scraps of nothing in any spare moment they had. So, you know, for most children, they were, as they had been for centuries, toys were just whatever you could find at hand and whatever you could make. As the Victorian age progressed, presents went from being just for children to being for the whole family. Well, first and foremost, we have a big thank you present to the Actons, and whilst Ruth can lay claim to the ribbon and myself to the wrapping paper, it's uh, Peter's handiwork. Mm -hmm. So, um... Well, it, it was our handiwork until it started going slightly wrong, and now it's my, <laughs> yeah. my handiwork. I firmly shifted the blame onto Peter. <laughs> so, Mr Axon, if I could thank pass that to you. Mm. What can it be? It's very heavy. 
Yeah, I think he's a door knocker. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, yes. Yeah. The, the fact, the fact you have you to much. guess. <laughs> yes, I think it'll be quite, quite uh, appropriately decorative. Happy Christmas, Mr. Acton. So it's um, it's obviously not a book this year then. No. <laughs> the farmers exchange their own homemade presents. Something metal, something long. Poker. Hey, that's really handy. <laughs> Thank you. Outwitted by a piece of paper. Again. <laughs> Ooh, wow, cricket white. Cricket white. <laughs> 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 it's a set of woolly underwear, boys. Oh, lovely. Do you want to try them on? I think later, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a little token. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and this ribbon. Oh, what a colour. I know. That's well today, as we did a bit of dyeing, and that just made the most amazingly zingy colours. Yeah. You don't want to hear this. It's made with stale urine, isn't it? Mm, lovely. <laughs> I did rinse it. I promise. Thank I you. Yeah, properly. It's safe to touch. <laughs> it's fine. <gasps> oh, how lovely. Look. Little lavender bag. Gorgeous. Yes. Thank you. Do you want to smell that? Too? Thank you very much. Well, this is one of Christmas's more ancient traditions. This is the the Yule log, and the idea is to get a log big enough so that it'll burn for the full 12 days of Christmas. And of course then, at the end of the 12 days, you take a small part of that wood, you keep it back and reuse it for next year, so that you get good luck throughout the year. I thought you might like to hear a little piano music. Yes. And as I can't play the piano very well, <laughs> I've got an invention here, made in America, uh, in the second half of the 19th century, which will play the piano for me. Providing I work hard on a pair of pedals. <laughs> I've got a, a small present for you all. My great grandmother wrote in her diary in 1883 that she took all the children oranges. So I've got some oranges for you here now. <laughs> Sophie, would you like them? Yes, and providing some well-earned vitamin C, I think. Thank you very much. Farm labourers. So I suppose it would have been quite an exotic fruit. It's hard to think of it as a sort of special thing these days, isn't it? We're all so used to oranges. But I expect, you know, many Victorian people saw one a year. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Delicious. Mine's wrapped in the wee wee ribbon. <laughs> yes, you appear to have drawn the short straw there, Peter. <laughs> Next, they head to the estate's church. Here, they're joined by the people of Acton Scott for a carol service, with a difference. John Kirkpatrick and his band are performing carols with familiar words, but unfamiliar tunes. In a poorer parish, uh, you'd just have the village band would play for the village dance on Saturday night, and then they'd come to church Sunday morning and play for the hymns and psalms and anthems, often very much the worse for wear, from Saturday night and they got slung out because they were too unruly and drunken. The church took action and banished these unruly bands, replacing them with organs, playing the standardised music we know today. A, a different repertoire was introduced that the organist would play in a very well-behaved way, and some of these old carols with the old band arrangements were lost, so it's nice to renew these uh, with this ensemble today. This is the first time these old tunes have been played here for over 150 years.
Finally, after weeks of preparation, it's time for the feast. At the village hall, Mr. Acton and his sons, Francis and Rupert, greet their tenants. What you're seeing here is the Victorian version of something thousands of years old. The lord of the manor, the owner of the land, feasting his tenants at Christmas. Christmas time. The ancient Romans did this, it happened all through the Middle Ages. And this is the very last generation in which it's going to happen. And what's more, the charity goes beyond this table, because the really poor people get presents in their houses of food or money at this time. But only the respectable actually get to eat with the Lord. As is. The culmination of weeks of work finally arrives with the serving of the food. That is beautifully decorated, it really is. The centrepiece is the Christmas pie. There's like a chicken and a duck and the breasts of a partridge and the breasts of a pigeon all forced in really, really tight. So it's solid meat in there. <laughs> Let's get stuck in. That's way too posh pie for the likes of you. It looks very good, Ruth. It is wonderful. Yeah. The Christmas turkey and all its trimmings also originated in the Victorian era, replacing goose. Delicious. Mm. Yes, very well cooked too. Little, no, little set of screws. If anybody worries about eating and drinking too much at Christmas, it's the essential Christmas experience. Religions and customs may come and go, but the midwinter tradition is a party involving food and drink. It's the great way since prehistory of avoid dying of depression at midwinter. One time of the year when you could be sure of being given the means of staying alive by those around you. Bring in the pudding. Oh, I'm really pleased. They turned out so nice. They look really good on the table, don't they? They do. They look fantastic. Thank you. Ooh, look at moist. Well done. I Marie. hope it tastes all right. Wonderful. Friends, can I ask you to stand up for a toast to our queen? Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. So, another chance to be Victorian farmers. Another chance to be Victorian farmers, and what fun we've had this time, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So here's to hard-working Victorian hard farmers. Hard-working Victorian farmers, absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Wherever they may be. <laughs> Dear friends, another toast. There's a toast to them as we love and a toast to them as loves us. And here's to them who loves them, who loves those, who loves those, who loves them that loves us. A toast. <laughs>